of the town of Wellfleet Conservation. Um, in the instance of a property burning down like that, that something be done within two years, nothing was done and no variance was requested. And for that reason, it's my understanding that nothing, that they are of the opinion currently that nothing can be done. Debbie? Yes. Is that because it's a non-conforming lot? No, no. It, it's a zoning bylaw that exists that requires essentially properties not be left abandoned and derelict. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. So the other thing that happened on that lot was, um, I think it was last year, they combined two lots. And so when you combined two lots, you essentially create a new lot. Oh. And they lost all grandfathering capabilities when they combined the two lots and created the new lot. So in addition to no construction commencing in the first two years, they also created a new lot, which took away all their grandfathering. So it's kind of a collection of unfortunate events that have happened out there. Also, they had promised Hillary that they would supply us with a water test. Did they do that for you? No, nope. Um, I did issue... Well, I attempted to issue the well permit, but there was a variance required to um, an abutting lot. And so I spoke to the well driller and he was gonna forge forward with the variance request mm -hmm. and do a sample well. So I think um, probably they're just retooling a little bit following the zoning board meeting and um, we should see the water test as soon as they do dig the well, but if they can't build on the lot, <laughs> I don't know what they'll do. I don't either. I just wanted to bring people up to date on what I understood was happening there because it's sort of an unusual process. Um, given our involvement, Board of Health involvement, zoning involvement, the combining of the two lots and the failure to build within two years. So it, it's just something that maybe we should be aware of for the future. Um, the other thing is that um, we're continuing to meet informally on Haas Pond. And Hillary, if you could just speak to that a little bit. Sure, we've been meeting with um, DEP. We've been meeting with our wastewater consultants some members of our wastewater team, members of DOT, mm -hmm. um, trying to push forward a redesign of the culvert and get some improvement out there so that the salt marsh doesn't die. Um, Natural Heritage is also participating because of the Terrapin. And it's slow going, but I think we're making progress. We have another meeting tomorrow. Um, it's tomorrow, right? I think it's tomorrow. Yeah. Tomorrow um, to see where we are. There was a design or mention of a culvert insert that would allow some salt water to flow through. And we've asked DOT to prioritize looking at that and seeing if we need to reconstruct the head wall and sort of fast tracking it because the longer it takes, the worse the situation is getting up there. So we should hear some more information tomorrow, possibly a cost estimate and see how we wanna proceed. Um, I had some conversation with Kurt about it and he sort of thinks if DOT can't find the money to do it now, we may be able to put an article on the warrant to um, pay for it ourselves and move ahead. Cause I think none of us want to wait too long and see the salt marsh die off anymore. So we'll see what tomorrow brings, but that's where we are. Also, we have a subcommittee that's been working on vessels and it's my understanding that they can go ahead tonight mm -hmm. and continue their report. Sure. Um, if they're prepared to do that, that would be great. Oh. <laughs> well. Otherwise, we can put it off till the first meeting in January. It's really your choice. Um, I would have to go down and look at, we had um, a, re a revised report, and we also had a, a suggested change to our regulations. So I don't, don't know if that has to be posted, Hillary. I think okay. we can, we're, we're not going to actually vote on anything, so we can talk about it. Um, if it's a proposal for the regulations, then we could submit that um, or hold on to that until Horsley Witten gets back to us, which should be pretty soon about what they're working on. So we can hold on to it. We can certainly hear from you on it. Um, okay, I have it on another laptop, so I have to run downstairs and get that. 
because um, Deb said today at the site visits that we probably wouldn't discuss this because it wasn't on the agenda. But I sent to you a revised report, which I'll run down and get, and then um, a suggested change to our regulations, which you could look at, which is very minimal, um, which you also have. So I'll be right back. Okay, let me see if I could pull it up as well. So. Okay. Yeah, the change in the regulations, there's two, just two paragraphs, so it's not a extensive. Does anybody know when Barbara sent it? Oh, you know. Uh, two days ago, I think. Okay. I can tell you exactly. Yesterday. Okay. Oh, right here. I got it. Uh, do you think we want to look at the revisions to the vessel section or the report? Well, Barbara. Um, Whatever you think we have time for. Okay, here's here's the um, regulation. Yeah, let's look at that first. Okay. Um, sorry, I wasn't prepared to do this. So no, no, I, it's I have I have too too many uh, things going here. Um, so it starts off with the definition. So on vessel, you're suggesting we remove, eliminate without a motor. Without a motor. Yeah, I'm just pulling up right. All right. All right. And yeah, you have it here. Thank you, Hillary. Yeah, of course. And then, um, so what we added was number one is different because we have something about private property which wasn't there before. Um, vessels and this is up for discussion, must be stored outside of the 100 foot buffer unless they are resting on a permitted storage structure such as a rack or floating, even at low tide and tied to a permitted dock or mooring or resting on a pre-existing area of open beach or other non-vegetated area above the high tide line. So that's a new uh, part of the regulation that has to do with private property. And otherwise everything's the same. So we well, I think the slight wording change in the second uh, point, uh, talking about fresh or salt water to try to cover ponds and also right. the, the, the bay. Um, right, okay. I just have a, a wording change suggestion in the, the first line of the first paragraph, ecologies. Uh, you know, we all know ecology is a discipline, and we really, I think we really should say here something else like environments or habitats, ecosystems, maybe habitats, but I don't think ecology works. Okay, that, that was in the, that's in the current regulations. Yeah. So we can change that. Uh, riparian habitats? I think so. Yeah, I like that. Okay. So I guess we can't vote on this because no, I think I think but, the best the best thing we can do is submit it to Horsley Witten mm -hmm. for inclusion in the regulations. Yep. And then we look at it with all of that, having done your careful review already of this section. Okay. I don't think it needs to go to Horsley Witten. I think this is part of our our charge to protect the coastline. But since they're, you know, incorporating all these things, we can do that as well. But I think we need a consensus from our committee before it goes there. I, I, I mean, if you're asking for a straw poll, I have no objection to what you're doing at all, Leon. He's approving. John Portnoy? Yes, I approve. John Cumbler? I approve. Um, ben? Yes, I approve. Michael Fisher, you're on the committee, so I assume you approve? <laughs> yes, and so is Ben. 
And Barbara, I assume you approve. So it yeah. sounds like you've got everyone's approval. Okay. So next it's good. Step, next steps is go to Horsley Witten and send yeah. it over with our yeah. other with our other list. So who does that? Hillary, do you have I that? do that? Okay, great. Great. Yeah. And then we have a, a few updates on our report if you want to go to the report, Hillary. Oops. Yes, I do. <laughs> uh, here we go. Okay, so the, the, the first part is, is pretty much the same. So if you go to action items, we have a couple of updates. Um, okay, so um, in terms of identifying which areas are appropriate or not appropriate for vessel storage, um, Ben went to a board of selectmen meeting where Suzanne was proposing some additional and changes to rack storage. So I don't know if you wanna report that, Ben, just to keep people updated about what Suzanne was proposing. Uh, <clears throat> sure, yeah. Um, I think it was uh, the type of thing where like the select board was her first stop <clears throat> to get um, to uh, just kind of field people's opinions about it. And, and I think she's going to, she said she's going to be um, submitting uh, an NOI or something. I'm not sure exactly what, but um, uh, permit application to us in the near future. Um, and essentially, she said that it was going to be a larger footprint, but the same capacity of 106 um, vessels. So I guess that's at Gull Pond. At Gull Pond. Yeah, at Gull Pond. Is that what you were talking about? Well, yes. all of her, whatever she said. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, at Gull Pond. Yep. And uh, it's so I guess whatever she's saying, whatever is at Mayo Beach and Indian Neck, um, apparently it's a, she she has seen that it's a lot more effective um, and um, easy to easier to use than the existing racks at Gull Pond um, because of it being just one level and it's just kind of easier to like navigate and to navigate your um, vessel onto or so to speak. And so she, uh, she just, it's a, it's a more preferable uh, way to go, but in order to have the same capacity at Gull Pond, it would just be a larger footprint. So she's going to be set, sending that proposal into us shortly. Um, and while I'm on the subject, uh, the select board was kind of had this like back and forth um, about whether or not there should be an increase in capacity. Um, like maybe if there's uh, an area that can have a second level. And I know that um, the pro one of the problems we were discussing is that there's just, there's limited storage space. So maybe we wanna look into that ourselves to see if maybe there could be a, an opportunity for more capacity at Gull Pond if, if we think it's necessary. Um, and uh, at, at any rate, they did not vote on anything, so they, I guess they were just getting Suzanne's um, like initial proposal, and I, I, they're going to vote on it in January or something. And so. this isn't proposed for next summer, it's, it's in the future, but right, she, right. she wants uh, to basically replace all the racks at Gull Pond with single tier racks that would take up a lot more footprint and she she also is proposing that the town charge the people that rent kayaks and give them spaces on town racks to leave kayaks that people are renting which I don't know if that's a good idea or not but that was another one of her proposals so I think we need to keep communicating with um Suzanne and, and figure out what she's thinking and seeing if it's compatible with um, conservation issues. I yeah. think I, oh. I had spoken with her a um, couple weeks ago about it and I thought she was proposing to put some of the newer racks in that center area that's sort of fenced off right now and it's over a hundred feet away from the pond's edge. But that was an area where 
people used to park and all the vegetation got destroyed there. I mean, yes. if, it's, if it's out of the hundred, I don't know what we could do about it, but it seems a shame that they fenced it off to prevent parking and yeah. now they're gonna have put, boats. Yeah. put boats there. So yeah. I think we need to be on top of this as, as much as possible because it's not just the boats, it's dragging them down to the water mm -hmm. and all the associated activities. Yeah, I'm sure she'd be happy to come and talk with us as well. Co Coincidentally, I just happened to walk through that that little that fenced in area this afternoon. It's, I mean, I was thinking about this. Yeah. And and looking at the you know the, the the geography there, and if if it were to go in the in the middle uh, in the fenced in area, it's all pine needles now. There's really nothing growing but the pine trees. But if it were to go there. Uh, I, you know, obviously you'd want to still exclude vehicles, but people would have to park on the roadways, I think, to, you know, to unload and load. So this is going to have to be some discussion, I think, with DPW about how that, how that could work logistically there. And I also think that if, if they got rid of some of the racks where they currently are, that should be revegetated before people start doing stuff there as well. So... More, more to come for, uh, for the town landing at Gull Pond. Uh, Michael uh, communicated with the Harbor Master and I think we have some pretty good rapport and he actually was very helpful in removing a bunch of vessels this fall yes. um, in various places in Wellfleet. I don't know if Michael wants to report any further about communications with the Harbor Master. Well, I haven't, I haven't spoken to him, but then when I went past the pier, there were a number of uh, kayaks uh, in the in a pen near the harbor master's office and their explanation was that they eventually they moved them out uh toward the dump where the town has this uh in the sand pit area mm -hmm. barbara just so um i understand were there any other areas where it, suzanne was talking about expanding the the number of um spots for kayak storage or boat storage so Ben went to the town meeting, uh, the select board meeting on Zoom. I was walking for turtles, so I couldn't go. But I think she was just talking about Gull Pond. Yeah, it was just Gull Pond. Okay. So if we move up now, just a few other things. I don't want to take up too much time because we'll have this on the agenda, um, hopefully next month. Um, so the rental company, Suzanne, is suggesting that they pay for storage uh, in, on town property. Um, as far as the Audubon and Lieutenant Island Homeowners Association, I, I've spoken to Melissa and they're very concerned and the Lieutenant Island homeowners are very concerned, but right now they, they are, haven't come to any decision. So I suggest that once we have a regulation, I send it to the Audubon because that storage on private property will affect what happens there. And mm -hmm. then let them decide if they want to get permits to put up racks or how they want to manage the area. But once we have a regulation, they'll know that even though it's Audubon land, they can't have what, what's occurring there now. And um, you know, I'll keep communicating with her, but right now we don't have a regulation about private property. So once we do, then it'll be easier to communicate with the homeowners association. That would apply to um, Fox Island too. I've, I talked to the state and they're willing to help us, but what they said was they could only um, uh, manage their own property. So they'll, they're they very uh, willing to put signs up that say no kayak storage, but they wanna sort of go back there and outline the property that they're, um, they manage. And they, they're gonna put a new sign up. Remember there was a sign that said Fox Island Wildlife Management Area yes. that someone knocked down. Well, they said there, I said, you know, no one even knows it's state because the sign's down. He said, well, they're gonna replace the sign and then they'll work with, with us as far as signage about boat storage on, they said they can't do anything if it's not their land, but if it's state property, they can post it, you know, where, applicable. So they're on board and I have to get back to them probably in the spring, make sure that they resurvey that area 
and then um, work with us on signage. It's not clear if they want their own signs or if they'll use our signs. If we come up with a sign, whether they'll let us to just, you know, put a post in the ground with a sign there. But and, um, I'm sorry, what about Omaha? Um, Omaha, as far as I know, that rack is either out or coming out or is washed out and th there'll be no more storage there. So they'll have to be assigned. We're gonna have to work on signage at all these landings, no vessel storage. Um, vessels will be confiscated or whatever we wanna say, but no more storage at Omaha either, which is gonna upset some of the folks from that homeowners association. I don't know if there's um, any kind of solution to that, but th that rack didn't work. So, and, and a lot of the people who used it didn't even live in that homeowners association. Yeah. Because they just got the rack through the town, it's town property. So anyone could use that, but that's not- I don't know if it's, oh, sorry. Go ahead, Michael. Uh, I, I don't know if it's at all useful, but I was in the DPW uh, working on some conservation trust stuff, and there are 20 metal signs that say vessels allow here only if they're permitted. So there's already some investment in, in signage. Mm -hmm. Already. Yeah. The, I, I wonder if we need a more effective sign. That is a sign that we have used in the past. We can resurrect it. Okay, well, if you so pay for them, it can just nail them up. Yeah. And then, um, as far as enforcement, um, we can still keep um, talking to the harbor master about removing vessels. And then Suzanne, the fellow who does the boats, the vessels in the summer, is um, can enforce that as well. But we just have to keep reminding them or when we noticed vessels like at, at, at Powers Landing when there were all those tubes and canoes and kayaks, we just have to keep reminding them that they're there. Um, no one's really gonna police this very vigilantly, I don't think. Um, I think we could develop outreach, which could um, go in the uh, Seasonal Homeowners Association newsletter and other places. That's number eight on this list. We did rewrite the regulations, which hopefully um, we all thought were okay and will hopefully be put into the regulations. And then um, the rest is just some, some work that we have to think about um, in terms of education and signage. So I think we've done all we can do right now, more, more to happen in the spring. But for example, I'm willing to write something up for that could be used for the seasonal residence newsletter or the beach sticker office. Um, but we need a little more communication with Suzanne, I think, um, and the Harbor Master. So any, anything Ben or Michael want to add? Yeah. Or <clears throat> I, I think, I think um, just like, like, not that you were really that, I don't think you, um, Suzanne was necessarily saying that um, the, she was going to block off racks for rental companies. I think she was, was mostly proposing um, that rental companies have to get a preseason use of town property, like right. permit or something. All um, right. And I don't think that's necessarily like designating a spot on the racks for that company. I think it's more um, just so that the, it covers them when any of the any of the renters leave their kayaks at um, uh, one of the one of our landings, um, but I think the other reason why that's kind of good is because it gives the harbor master a chance to kind of um, establish like a like a communication with these companies and to know like which you know start to get to know which vessels are for which company, and I think that'll just kind of organically. Um, help the harbor master um, do the enforcement on that end. But if we could, if we could talk to Suzanne about it, maybe at the next meeting or whenever we talk about this again, it would be cool, good, good for her to come. 
Yeah, I think it's different if someone rents a kayak and brings it and launches it, they shouldn't have to pay for use of town property. It's just if the kayak company brings the vessels there and distributes them, that, that's a different scenario. And I think both things happen. A lot of people just rent for the week and put it on mm -hmm. their car and bring it back and forth or leave it there <laughs> as it turns out. But, um, but it is also possible that they might want to store it and pay for storage for a week too. I don't know. We'll have to talk to Suzanne about that, right. Hillary, could you make sure that um, this is on the agenda for our next meeting, which I think is January 6th? Yeah, I, I wrote down to ask Suzanne if she can attend. Um, and the other thing, Barbara, our, our AmeriCorps member, Jordan, can help out with um, communication documents. So if you okay. have like, you know, points you want her to hit on, we can share those with her and she can make a brochure or a flyer or, you know, work on a couple different things. Maybe um, we could get her to do maybe a video also for the website or, you know, we can, we, we can put her on that task because she's been sent remote as well. So she's not in the office. So she's looking for projects. Okay. Um, How do I communicate with her? I will send you her email. Excellent. All right. That, that would be great. And then yeah. I think, um, before the meeting, we should send this report to Suzanne so she just knows what we've been thinking and she, she sees where the beach administrator is identified as having an action item. So she yeah. just knows what we're thinking ahead of time. Sure. If you could send that to Suzanne yes. and ask her if she has other points also. Yeah. That'd be great. It, it would be really great if the harbor master came too. Yeah. Also, I think WCT, the Wellfleet Conservation Trust, should be there because they do some of the kayak racks still. Yeah, and I think they have a good model in case the Audubon wants to do that. It would be a good way for Audubon to raise a little money if they put up a rack that got permitted by the Conservation Commission, like the Wellfleet Conservation Trust, and then they charge $100 a season or whatever. Audubon can make some money on this. They might be interested in that. <laughs> <laughs> okay thank you very much is there anything else on vessels that we need to cover now no i think you've heard enough <laughs> <laughs> okay. okay then um hillary is there any mail no um the work at blash began and doug and i were out there um earlier Maybe the end of last week and again earlier this week and that's progressing as we expect um they're going to be covering the rolls with sand and i got a call from steve today saying can we go and have another look because he's not sure how long the sand is going to last but um that construction is underway the last part of the job just covering everything with sand is um what's remaining and you saw Barbara's letter asking if we could ask you the turtle sweep. Yes, I've I um, reached out to Steve, and that's being done every day as well. Thank you okay. very much. Okay, then any jurisdictional opinion? Uh, I'm sorry, John. John, John has this. Yeah, I have a question about that project. When I went, was doing a turtle walk. I walked by there, and they had a plywood structure in front of the rolls. That's removed before the yep. second put down. Yes. Yep. Yes. Yep. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay, jurisdictional opinions, Hillary? None. Okay. Wow. Then um, meeting minutes. I think we have one set. Two sets, I think. I'm not Two sure. Sets. Chris, can you let us know how many sets we have? We have two meeting minutes we need to approve. Okay. Um, um, we were so busy at our last meeting and exhausted. <laughs> right. Okay. Could you give me the dates of those, please? Uh, uh, um, one second. Thank you. I had that on my other computer. Uh, um, I have the dates if you need them. Yeah, it, that would be helpful because I November have eighteen and December two. Okay. Um, could I have a motion to approve the minutes 
of the meeting of November 18th, 2000. So moved. Could I have a second? Second, Michael. All those in favor, I need a voice vote. Leon? Yes. Barbara? Yes. John Portnoy? Yes. John Cumbler? Yes. Ben? Yes. Michael Fisher? Yes. Debbie? Yes. And then I need a motion for the minutes of December 2nd, 2020 to approve. So moved, Leon. Is there a second? Second. Second. Okay, I need a voice vote on that. Michael Fisher? Yes. Ben? Yes. John Cumbler? Yes. John Portnoy? Yes. Barbara? Yes. Leon? Yes. And Debbie? Yes. So those are both approved. Okay, um, the only other thing and that I would like to discuss was I was approached as we were on Hiawatha Road, Hillary, by apparently a homeowner either on Hiawatha or Samoset, who was again very concerned and upset about the condition of the road and told me that it was a public road, not a private road. And she thought it was falling in and I told her she would have to speak to you. So that is something that we do have to address and should be put on the agenda at some point, um, either with DPW, if, they, if it truly is a public road, or if it is a private road with notice to all the homeowners that you know, something needs to be done because it's a, as you look at Sewell's gutter, it's eroding more and more into and undermining Hiawatha Road. So we probably want to talk with Mark and Jay first um, and see what their plan is for Hiawatha. Um, I'm sure they have one. So let's hear from them. Okay. If you could put that on a future agenda, that'd be great because it, there have been some incredibly high tides and um, even the pavement is, that's damaged and lying there is moving. Yeah, the Hiawatha side. Yes. Mm -hmm. I don't know if anybody else has noticed it. The Omaha side is private, right? Yes. Yes. Yeah, I noticed that going down, it was very steep right on the edge of the road, and it was just sand, so. I don't know when that road was last paved. I don't know when the pavement fell in, but if someone could give us the history of what's happened there and what they've attempted to do there, that would be great too. I think there is an interesting history of that road. I think it, it used to be an access for the shell fishermen um, before those stairs were put in. Hillary will probably know more than me. But, yeah. um, but the, when the house was built at the end, apparently there was some septic, some issue where um, their septic system may have been put in and the road was changed and the shell fishermen were given access via Omaha instead by the homeowners there. So they, they stopped using the public road. Um, and they can't use it now because it doesn't go onto the beach. There's just some stairs that were put in. So we could, it would be interesting to get a history of that because what I'm saying is just hearsay and I don't know for sure about all those things that I just mentioned. Also, but the, the Stossels put a septic system in um, at the end and I don't believe there was vehicular access from the Hiawatha side during that time, during construction. There was pedestrian access and it was pedestrian access that they had to put back and maintain. Okay. So I don't know about the vehicular access. I was under the impression that that had been on Omaha for some time. Um, for, a for a long time. But when yeah. I was on the Shellfish Advisory Board about 20 years ago, all of this happened. And they said, if we're losing our access to our grants on Hiawatha, we need access. And, the, um, and um, Sterling and others said, well, you can use our road. But she also said, we, help, we want you to help pay for the grading of it that we do every year. And they haven't done that yet. So mm -hmm. it's, it's a 
interesting what's happened down well, who, who barbara who from the shellfish advisory board or <clears throat> group would know the history along with dpw nobody because they're all young shell fishermen who weren't around at the time the only one who might know a little bit about the history is helen wilson yeah that's what i was going to suggest yeah. helen mm -hmm. hillary maybe i i hesitate to give you more work but maybe you, you could talk to helen and see what she recalls i can do that because i'm pretty friendly with her and the other thing about that road is that it's controversial now because um, omaha was a private road but Helen is saying now that the town bought the Hilda Trust, it's it's a town road now too. The town has rights to the town access. Has rights that town is a is an owner, not that the town owns the road, but the town is an owner now that they bought the Hilda Trust. So, uh, so I, I'll I'll talk to Helen. I'm sure she'll love to fill me in <laughs> on all the details, and maybe I'll even write a report. <laughs> <laughs> that is great. <laughs> I mean, I don't mean to, to, you know, throw mud over this conversation, but it seems to me if the road is in trouble, that's DPW's and the homeowner's concern, not ours. Our concern is when they try to do something about repairing the road, they need to talk to us then. I don't think we need to be involved at this point. I mean, I th if the road deteriorates, that's not our business. And well, I think if it, the road isn't, is, it, it's another situation where the road may collapse. And I think it behooves us to learn about it. I'm not saying we get involved in making any decisions, mm -hmm. but I think learning the background so that if we do have to come in in an emergency situation puts us in a better place. That's just my thinking. Okay. And John, you know, we have nothing better to do during these COVID times. <laughs> so this is actually an activity for me. For me. Um, John Portnoy, do you know anything about the road? No, I, I don't know the history at all. Mm -hmm. No. All right. Okay. Is there anything else that anyone wants to address in the business meeting portion? I have a question. Go ahead. Uh, Hillary, I left you a message about an outdoor shower in construction. Yeah. Yep. Story in that. Do we have a voice or not? Do we have a voice? Yes, we have a voice. Um, I had sent Doug out to have a look at it, and we'll send a letter and follow up as usual. Okay. Hillary, on another location, there's a house at 375 King Philip Road where they're doing a lot of work, and they've put up a large um, plastic netting all around the house, and I'm not sure whether they're working in the buffer zone or not as it approaches the marsh. And I'm not sure that whether the netting fence is in the buffer zone or not. And I wasn't sure if you had been notified of any work going on there. I'm not no, sure if they're doing work or it's just protective, I don't know. Okay, I'll have a look at that one. Oh, one other question while, while we have time. There's been a lot of noise and um, use of um, weed whackers and things all along Eel Creek from um, Chris Drive to Gull Pond. I think it's mosquito control. Yes. Oh, okay. Th yeah. There's been a lot of noise going on back there and I'm just wondering what- Yeah, happening. there was, in fact, uh, yesterday or the day before they were cutting around that uh, red maple swamp next to the Bartlett's house near the Sluice uh -huh. Way. Oh boy. And okay. they do that in the winter, uh, supposedly to, so they have access paths to apply mosquito larvicide in the summer. <clears throat> there's, okay. there's a question, more than a, it's not just, I think it's an answered question. Uh, they really don't have jurisdiction within the national seashore, except in the province lands lands conveyed from the province lands or Pilgrim State Park, you know, all of which is in North Truro and Provincetown. But they still do things in the National Seashore here in Wellfleet. Um, I don't think they have the authority, but uh, it's something that maybe Hillary could broach with uh, the seashore at some point. We get to Lauren maybe and just 
put a bee in her bonnet about it? I, I used to put bees in people's bonnets when I was an employee and I, I didn't get very far, but um, maybe Hillary <laughs> should talk with Lauren. <laughs> not, not allowed. These are bees that don't have stingers. Right. I think Tim Smith and I have had this conversation before as well. So I can, I can ask them. Yeah, they've been very busy back there all week. Now, now they do have authority if there's um, a public health threat as determined by the CDC. Um, and I don't know if that's been determined yet. I know they're, they've caught, over the last year or two, they've caught some um, mosquitoes carrying some bad viruses, mm -hmm. including in the ponds area. Right. <clears throat> Hillary, is there anything that you think we need to address? Not at this moment. Okay, then I think we should take a break and reconvene at five for the um, public hearings. Oh, Debbie, I just want to mention one other thing, really interesting uh, real world situation is I noticed, I was out at Duck Harbor the other day and I noticed there's an overwash of the Duck Harbor yeah. um, barrier beach. And I'm sure others have seen it. I guess yeah. it's been there for a while, but I, I first saw it. And I've never seen that Barrier Beach, um, that dune system overwash in the 40 years I've lived here. Uh, sands being carried over into the freshwater wetland on the backside. I, and I, I, I have no concerns about it. I just think it's really interesting. Some people may start getting exercised about, you know, a new inlet at Dock Harbor or something which absolutely is not going to happen, but just so you know about it. Okay. Started last year. So is Joe time. Fox still around? Pardon? Is Joe Fox still around? Joe, Joe Fox? Fox? Oh, he passed yeah. away. He, he passed away. Okay, because I know this was one of his like main topics of conversation. Oh. Right. So you're talking, as you approach from the parking lot, on the path you're to the right that's what i'm thinking yeah. yeah it's very very close to the path on the right on the north side okay and a, a lot of uh, this isn't our jurisdiction either but so many new social paths everywhere in the seashore especially there were so many people here this summer and through the fall that um and with the high tides people are just marching every place upland so interesting well, we can't address the ones that are not on right. town property or private property within right. the buffer zone right it, are you on that committee barbara the which one the paths committee the public access yeah uh, no that's that committee is going through some really stormy times <laughs> I, I they email me all the time about things and i and i tell them that um, they have to talk to the seashore, they have to talk to the Audubon, they have to talk to the town uh, about different things. And they're, uh, the, I guess the fellow who was in charge of it, uh, what was his name? I forget. He, he resigned. Um, Ryan Curley's trying to get them to do some work, but it, it's been very frustrating because there are a lot of issues where they can't figure out who owns the property that the path or the access is on and what rights do people have and um and if it's a town landing i had a big conversation with ryan Curley about this if it's a town landing he said can people go there even if they're going through conservation land um what are the accesses to the town landing so they're trying to figure out all this and it's very complicated but i was not uh, selected to be on that committee, and I'm thanking God every day I'm <laughs> not on that committee. <laughs> I'm, I'm wondering, Hillary, if we should invite them to come and talk to us at some point. I, su I suggested that if they want to answer to these questions, I could not answer them on my own, that they should come to a meeting. And they said, okay, but they, they've not followed through. And there's no one to communicate with now because the committee is sort of dysfunctional at this point. <laughs> well, that's not helpful. But I guess my thinking is that since they're working on things which might fall within our jurisdiction, it would behoove us to work together 
at least to hear what they have to say. And maybe in February, that might be an appropriate time to try and hear what they're thinking and what they're looking at and see if we could offer some help to them. What um, is the committee called? It's the Right to Public Access. And it was formed by the Board of Selectmen. Okay. And it was an extension of a, a, another committee that used to exist, was part of the um, Open Space Committee or NRAB. They had a committee about access that just disbanded for some reason. So this is a new uh, <clears throat> a reiteration of that committee. I don't know. I mean, would people be interested in hearing what they're looking at and what they're doing? Because I think it does overlap with what we protect if it's in the buffer zone. All right. Last I heard, they were having all these um, discussions with Audubon and the Lieutenant Island Homeowners Association because um, there is public property at the end of Lieutenant Island Road. I forget within Marsh Road that goes around um, to the very end of Lieutenant Island on the southwest corner. Okay. There's public land, but it's a private road to get to the public land and there's no uh, Audubon put up and the, the homeowners association put up no parking. So they're saying, how could it be public access if we can't park there? I said, well, you could walk there or bike there, but you can't park there. If the road is private, you can't park on it unless you have permission. So they're going through all of those kinds of issues now. So that was the last I heard. They had some big issues on Lieutenant Island and the kayak issue is another, that parking lot is another access issue as well. Is there anything else then, John? Um, I recommend we don't invite a dysfunctional commi committee <laughs> to us. <laughs> I, Quite well on our own. Yeah, I, I agree. I mean, I can keep communicating with Ryan Curley and find out if there is a leader and what they're doing, but I, I wouldn't invite them because I already, in, I already invited them. I said, you should come to a conservation commission meeting and let us know your concerns and what areas you're concerned about and what regulations you're concerned about. And um, th they should know to do that. Okay. Um, Debbie, it looks like Mark up here in the corner uh, has been on the whole meeting. I don't know if he has something he'd like to share with us. No, I'm just waiting for the public part so that I can get to the courier application. Okay. All right. Thank Plus you. it's good to catch up with you guys again. <laughs> All right, I apologize if, if anybody else has been sitting and has not been called upon. Nope. Okay, then we'll take a 10 minute recess and come back for the um, public hearings portion. I need a motion to adjourn the business meeting. So moved, Michael. Second. Leon, second. All right, I need a voice vote, Leon. Yes. Barbara? Yes. Ben? Yes. Mike Fisher? Yes. Ben? Yes. Um, John Cumbler? Yes. John Portnoy? Yes. And Debbie? Yes. All right, we'll see you back at five o'clock. Okay, we have a 10 minute break. Are you there? All right.
Yeah. I went down to a Chinese restaurant and it was packed. I just said, I'm too tired. I couldn't wait around there. Just make a sandwich. Yeah. There's still ham and turkey. is the public hearings portion of the Town of Wellfleet Conservation Commission meeting of December 16th, 2020. It is held pursuant to Massachusetts General Law, Chapter 30A, Sections 18 to 25, as amended, the Wetlands Protection Act, the Wellfleet Environmental Bylaw, and its regulations. We are conducting this hear these hearings remotely pursuant to Governor Baker's orders and the members of the commission are all present. The first matter on our agenda is Laurel Nominee Trust, Zimmerman 715 Chequesset Neck Road, Map 113, a request for a two-year extension. Is anyone present for that matter? Sorry. Um, let's just make sure we get the map and parcel correct. Um, Chris did revise the agenda online um, with the proper map and parcel. So um, Chris, do you have that appropriate map and parcel handy? Yes, it's map 19, parcel 113. Okay. Yeah. And that's 715 Chequesset Neck Road. And they were requesting the extension to complete the planting and make sure that the plants survive. They're requesting a two year extension. Okay, I'm the supervisor for that project and they um, by mistake installed an underground irrigation system in the 50, which they weren't supposed to do. But then we decided that they shouldn't take it out because that would be more disruptive and they should just leave it in till the plantings are established. So I think that's why they're asking for the two year extension, but then we have to make sure that they remove that underground irrigation system. Hillary, do we have the ability to call them in at that point? Yeah, yes. Um, they're pretty responsible. I don't think we're gonna have an issue with it, but yes, yes, they're aware of that condition and we can call them in. Robert, does that take care of your issue? Sure. Okay, and the other thing is, do we have a survival rate for the plants? I would assume we do. Yeah, we did. I don't have the whole file with me, but we did. Okay, then um, could I have a motion for to grant the two-year request for extension? So move. So move, Michael. Is that second, Michael? Second, Barbara. Yes. Oh, okay. Sorry. I need a voice vote. Ben. Yes. John Cumbler. Yes. Um, Leon. Yes. Michael Fisher. Yes. John Portnoy. Yes. Barbara. Yes. And Debbie. Yes. That's all set. Is there a form Could we I have ask to a fill question? out? Whoops. Yeah. Is it form seven extension permit of orders of conditions? Correct. Oh, okay. So form seven to fill out. Yeah. Okay. It's my understanding that the next matter 
Booza, 40 uh, Weedamu has been removed from the um, tonight's agenda, so we don't need to consider that. The next matter is Simons slash Sagan, 55 Alvis Avenue Road, Map 15, Parcel 136, a Certificate of Compliance. Hillary, is there anyone here for that? Um, I don't believe so. Barbara was the supervisor on that project, so I believe she can give us a report. Yes, I, I was there this week and um, everything looks great. The plantings look great. Um, the whole project actually was finished before COVID, but the plantings uh, now have had uh, a bit of time to establish and it all looks good. Okay, could so, I have a, I'm so sorry. I'll, I'll move that we grant the um, Certificate of Compliance for um, Simon's uh, Sagan at 55 Alves Road, Map 15, Parcel 136. Is there a second? Second. All right, I need a voice vote. John Portnoy? Yes. Barbara? Yes. John Cumbler? Yes. Ben Fairbank? Yes. Michael Fisher? Abstain or recuse. Leon Shreve? Yes. And Debbie Freeman, yes. That's all set. The next matter is Lackner, 66 Hiawatha Road, Map 28, Parcel 178, RDA Repair and Upgrade Pathway. Is there anyone here for this? Yes, I just saw Margaret Lackner enter the room, so I think she can go ahead and... Um... I'm going to unmute her and she can describe the project and describe to us what happened. Okay. Um, I uh, described it the best I could in what I wrote. Um, basically, there's always been a pathway up from the road to the house. And um, uh, at one point when I uh, first bought the cottage, the, there was parking all along the front there and it was sort of unconstrained. And um, I decided I wanted to move the parking off to the side. And at that time, I just moved the stones over and just kind of put them in the dirt. <laughs> um, and uh, they weren't really stable and um, became a tripping hazard. Uh, so I didn't realize, obviously, that I needed to request permission to reset them. And I did um, bring in some stone dust to reset them in, hoping it would make it more stable. Um, so, um, mea culpa, I need to figure out, you know, and work with you to figure out what I need to do. Okay, it, it sounds like there's been work done here that was unpermitted. Correct. I didn't realize that I needed a permit to move, to reset the stones that were there. Or to move the, the parking area? The parking area I did move um, with permission from CONSCOM, and that included adding some plantings in that area. I don't have, um, since I'm not in my home in Boston, I don't have the records of exactly when I received permission um, okay. to move the parking area over and to do some plantings there to help against erosion. I mean, someday I'd like to fix the parking area because it's eroded and their branches sticking up, I'm roots sticking up all over the place, but um, that's another day. Okay, so it's there's work though that's been done in the corner of the parking area near the stairs. Is that correct? Correct. I reset. I reset the the um the stairs. Okay, so it's the, but Hillary, what do we do with an after the fact filing for an RDA? You're muted. Uh, so say she did file the after the fact filing fee. And then it's up to the commission to determine whether the work that she had completed is um, substantial enough to warrant the filing of a notice of intent or if the request is appropriate for the work that was done. All right, I'll open it up to the commission, Barbara. What was the, what type of a pathway did you have before you reset the stones? They were the blue stone pavers. It was the same thing, but just set differently? Correct. Um, there was wood in the pathway. There were wooden pieces going across the pathway. The bluestone pavers that you have there now are all new. Those have, those have been there for years. I don't remember any wood in the pathway, frankly. I've had the place since 1985. 
My memory may not be perfect, but I don't remember any wood in the pathway. There, I have the, um, I have uh, untreated timbers, um, you know, uh, to define the parking area so cars don't go wherever they want to. Um, I have that around the perimeter, but uh, that's all work that I did when I reset the um, parking area. <clears throat> Barbara? I I'm just concerned about the amount of hardening that I now see there. Mm -hmm. And um, want to add, and to me, the pathway looks kind of treacherous and could be slick. I'm wondering why you just didn't put a gravel path up to the house because the slope isn't very uh, significant there. Um, well, you know, I um, initially there had been some pavers and they were on a slope and that was slippery. And um, I wanted to have something that I could walk on barefoot because I. I always am barefoot. That's why I didn't do gravel. <laughs> but you know, I'm I'm open to suggestion. I can reduce the amount of of um, hardening. Um, I'll do whatever I need to do to make to correct the situation. Um, I did want to have something that I could shovel when winter comes. Um, The thing I'm most displeased with is it seems to be a pattern on Hiawatha Road, and I don't know why, for people to go ahead and do things without getting the appropriate permits from the Conservation Commission. We've had this happen repeatedly on Hiawatha, and I don't know why it's continuing to happen. I don't either. This was my mistake. You know, I own my mistake because I didn't understand that I couldn't reset the pavers. Um, I can apologize and I will correct it. Um, you know, I'm just one person and I'm responsible for myself. The other thing is, Hillary, when you look at the diagram that was submitted with this, mm -hmm. I don't think that the 50 feet and the 100 foot buffer are correct. We were out there today and I, I may be wrong, but I think that the 50 feet starts from the top of the bank, which is right next to the road. And this shows us, I believe, in the picture I looked at, down into the marsh. Yeah, there's a, like a little peninsula. I went on the, um, the website. Uh, let's see. Um, yeah, there's the, the setback that's on the GIS website shows, see that sort of pointed area a little to the left of your cursor? And, but in any case, I don't even think that that affects it, but the um, setback that I showed was from um, a survey that was done when I had a new Title V septic system installed. Yeah, if you look at the um, plot plan that she submitted, um, it's it's the one that has Hiawatha Road clearly labeled on it and Tecumseh Road. It does show the 100 foot buffer zone clearly and then 50. So most of the work is, you know, within the 50 to 100 um, yeah. the parking yeah. area is bordering into the 50. Yeah. I mean, that's my concern is the hardening in the 50. Okay. Um, so I guess then I need to figure out what the, what an appropriate way to reduce the amount of hardening in that area is so that, and still not have to wear shoes all the time when I go outside. I mean, people have used wood chips in paths. Mm -hmm. Something that can allow the water to infiltrate down into it. Mm -hmm. Also, uh, pea gravel, pea-sized gravel. You know, it's like three-eighths gravel. You can comfortably walk barefoot on that. I can vouch for that. Okay. 
And would it be allowable to have some um, intermittent pavers? We would need to see a design plan. Okay. So I think, Margaret, the best thing would be to um, ask for a continuance, <clears throat> come back and show us a design with okay. the gravel or wood chips and the bluestone, you know, in between that. So reduce okay. the hardscaping in the 50, zero to 50. Okay. Also, if you're intending to do something with the parking area. I would come back to you. I've learned my lesson. No, I was going to say, and you're planning on doing it now, you might want to include that in your plan so that you don't have to come back repeatedly. Okay. Okay. Yeah, it, it just, you know, there, there um, are roots now exposed, which can't be good for them. And I know I've tripped over them in the dark a couple of times myself. So, okay. um, yeah. When and so our next meeting is January 6th, that Wednesday. We would need the paperwork one week prior to that um, to get it into the commissioner's packets. So, may I ask whether I could continue it one more? Yeah, one absolutely. Just because absolutely. Of the holidays and all that stuff. Yeah, for sure. Okay. That would be January twentieth, I believe, unless that's a holiday. Also, uh, is that Martin? No, Martin Luther King Day is on a Monday, right? Okay. So I'm, the 20th. I'm getting my calendar out. I'm not hundred percent sure. Okay. Yeah, it's the 20th. Martin Luther King Day is the 18th. Okay. okay. And I'll have to figure out um, in terms of the parking area, uh, I'm assuming that I would need to use again, um, you know, just to hold back the uh, you know, sand and soil where the plantings are, um, you know, untreated timbers if I'm using timbers. Yeah. Um, and just uh, pea gravel or something walkable surface. For that sounds good right. yep with no apron correct yes yeah, correct <laughs> no apron <laughs> no apron and um you know generally i would assume that they would put down some kind of gravel and then the pea stone is, is that correct I mean, i'm not an expert in this I'm, i can get some i can get some help on it but yeah i okay. think that's your best bet okay i will do the best i can Okay, so can I have a motion to continue Lackner to January 20th, 2021? So moved. Is there a second? Second, John Cumbler. Okay, I need a voice vote. John Portnoy? Yes. Barbara Brennesel? Yes. John Cumbler? Yes. Ben Fairbank? Yes. <clears throat> Shreve? Yes. Michael Fisher? We choose. Okay, Debbie Freeman? Yes. You're all set. Thank you very much. Okay. Good evening. The next person, I'm sorry, the next hearing is Thornton 1305 State Highway, map 30, parcel 159. It's an RDA for a septic upgrade. Is anyone present for that? Yep, we have Jason Ellis present. Yeah, this is Jason. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Uh, so this is a septic upgrade. This property is currently in the process of being sold. Uh, it has a, a single cesspool at the rear of the property or the rear behind the house. Um, and what we're looking to do is to install a new 1500 gallon septic tank behind the house with an Arenco Advantex system, nitrogen reducing system, um, and a new leach area to the north of the property. The leach area is located where it is because the well where it is now is actually in the bill in the basement of the building so in order to get 100 feet from the well which is required um we had to push the leach field up to the north edge of the property and that's also the the elevated part of the property which allows us to get the five foot separation to groundwater below the leach area um most of the disturbed area that we're looking to do the the uh, construction of the septic is is lawn area um and that area would be revegetated with conservation grass seed mix after the construction. Um, this project was approved by the Board of Health last week, so that part is ready to go. So if, we, um, if you have any questions, I'd be happy to try to walk you through it. Barbara? <clears throat> yeah, I, I have two questions. Um, 
was there any consider consideration into moving the well so that the uh, leach field could be moved further south on the property? That's the first question. Um, we, okay, go ahead. Okay. I was going to say, we, we, we looked at doing that. The only problem with that is it moves it closer to the salt marsh, and we were worried about the possibility of getting more salt intrusion into the well um, and getting fresh water. The, the, from what I understand, the water quality of the well in the basement right now is pretty good. So, um, like I said, I just said, be a little reluctant to move the well to the south, which moves it closer to that salt marsh. <clears throat> okay, and the second question is, did you consider some kind of, um, instead of a leach field, a uh, drip system for underground watering instead of having a leach field? You can't do that in lieu of a leach field. You, you, you can do it in conjunction with a leach field. You're still required to put a leach field in if you did, if you did a drip irrigation system. So that doesn't get but you around having to... Yeah, you can do it. Okay. You can do a drip irrigation system, but you still need to have a conventional leach field also. So, okay, so that wouldn't get you anywhere really in terms of. No, it would create more disturbance than what than what we're okay. proposing. So, all right, those are my two questions. Are there other questions from the commissioners? Could I have a motion then, please? I move that we accept this proposal for a new septic system for property on 1305 State Highway. Well, Is there a second? Yeah, I'm second. All right, I need a voice vote. John Portnoy? Yes. Barbara Brennesel? Yes. John Cumbler? Yes. Ben Fairbank? Yes. Leon Shreve? Yes. Michael Fisher? Recuse. Debbie Freeman, yes. You're all set. A negative three, I Thank think. You. Yep, correct. Thank you, everybody. So RDA form for that one, guys. Yes. All right, the next matter is Courier. 1015 to Crescent Neck Road, map 19, parcel 93. It's an RDA to install ground mount, seven two, two by 10 forms, 12 inch wide and nine feet long for 30 solar panels. Is anyone present for this matter? I am Mark Robinson. Do you wanna go ahead and explain what's happening? Yes, uh, we have um, previously done seven similar uh, applications, uh, three of them solar, excuse me, two of them solar, and uh, five of them were those vertical axis wind turbines. So I'm familiar with uh, working with the setbacks and working also with trying to be um, producing as little disruption to the vegetation as possible. Uh, we've been pretty successful doing that so far. So um, I'm hoping we get a similar result here. Uh, Charlie's had very good results with the solar that we put in over at 1045. And so he's looking to do something similar, same style of construction that we use there, only at 1015. And uh, the location that we put on the, uh, I drew in on the plot that was done by Slate Associates in 2010, uh, shows the area, it's really the only area that we can take advantage of because there are trees to the south of that. So we pushed it as far towards that northern boundary as we could, still maintaining the 25 foot setback. Uh, and we are actually farther away from the top of the coastal bank than the site that was approved and used for the vertical axis wind turbine we put in. So I'm hoping that um, by locating it there, uh, we will have little or no disruption to the vegetation. Uh, we will uh, be doing an underground run to the house, which is a distance of about 15 feet over an area that currently has no vegetation on it. 
Uh, we would be putting a trench down to the 24 inch level, putting in PVC conduit, and then replacing it and putting the original top facing back on there. Um, the, we've uh, presented information before about the style of uh, foundation that we use. It's not an intrusive foundation. It essentially is what they call a grade beam. It's um, for all intents and purposes sitting on the surface. You have about 10 inches of it or so that is set down into the top of the, um, of the soil and the rest of it is sitting above it. Uh, the only um, creatures we have to be cautious about are the turtles that uh, that area is um, marked out for. And obviously the turtles can walk in between and around uh, these things. They don't present a solid um, prohibition to them making any transit across that property. Um, currently they're set up to go uh, virtually parallel to the top of the coastal bank. So there wouldn't be any channeling of uh, any surface water towards the, the top of the coastal bank. Uh, and if anything, it acts as a stabilizing force. We, the design that we put together is a little shallower angle for the panels than we did at Charlie's other um, installs. Uh, partially because I'm trying not to have it become really uh, an impediment to any kind of vision from the neighbors, which are his in-laws next door. Uh, there is some vegetation between that and them, which should hide most of it. Um, and we've had very good success long-term with this style of installation. Uh, I believe that somebody went out and walked the property and I didn't write down the man's name who did. Um, That was probably Michael doing a site visit. Probably not. But not we were all. Time. No, we were out there today. Today, yeah, we were there today. Okay, are there any questions that I can answer? John Portnoy, does this have to go to natural heritage if we're talking about terrapin um, nesting? No, I just had a look. Um, uh, hold on, I'll just share my screen with you here. Uh, here we go. I just wanted to check that to see if it was in their jurisdiction and it is not in their jurisdiction. So estimated and priority falls here, but not here. Okay. John, do you have anything further? Um, yeah. When we were out there today, we saw that what, there's apparently some relatively new construction, certainly post 1978. Um, and I think Doug was going to, Doug, um, we um, was going to check on whether or not it had been permitted, a deck and uh, an outside shower stall. Doug sent me an email saying that it was not in the file. Um, it looked like new wood when we were out there, there, Hillary. It looked like the deck had been rebuilt or added and the shower had been placed. I don't know if they were old and replaced. I don't know if they were new. But Doug informed me that he did not find anything in the file about it. Uh, what I had seen before, not that it's official, but I do remember there being a deck there that I told my guys uh, not to walk on because it was uh, unsafe. Uh, so I'm not surprised that you know he's gone through and uh, replaced the decking that was in there. It was pretty ugly. Well, if it's if it's in our jurisdiction. We would need to be informed of that. That's fine. And I don't see anything that tells me one way or another. Barbara? My question is in reading the plan, I'm not sure how much of this proposed array is within um, the 50 foot buffer zone and what is in the 100 foot buffer zone. I see a line, but I can't read what it says on the plan that I have. The dotted line or the yeah. one that, the dotted line is called the footpath. No, I see the top of the coastal bank. Yep. And then I see another little line above that parallel yes. to. That's, that's labeled footpath. 
That's the path that they take down across to the other property. Okay, so. Okay, then where's the 50 and 100 foot buffers to the top of the coastal bank? So if you flip, uh, Barbara, to the other plan uh, that has three properties on it. Four. Four. Yeah, the one that says courier overall. Um, you might need a magnifying glass, but you can see the 50 foot line runs above the footpath. It's rather difficult to see. And then the 100 foot is further above. It's really difficult to read, though. I think we're going to need a better diagram that shows us the 50 foot and the 100 foot because we can't tell where it is within our jurisdiction, Hillary. So we want to see the um, solar array shown on a site plan. Okay. That picks the 50 and 100 and perhaps at the same time, uh, you could ask your client about the deck and the outdoor shower that appears to be reconstructed because that may be a showstopper. We're going to need a continuance. Oh, yeah. 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 Can I ask a question, please? Yeah. Uh, on the 50. And, and I just point. want to. Um... Go ahead, Barbara. Barbara? I, I just wanted to mention that our regulations don't permit any new structures within the 50 foot buffer zone. And if this is in the 50 foot, then I don't think it's permittable. Okay, so Mr. Robinson, you had a question? I, she answered the question. So uh, the turbine that we put in there is clearly within the 50 foot coastal range coastal buffer. Um, Each commission has the commissioners, has the members it has, and they may choose to grant a variance to the regulations or they may not, but Barbara okay. is correct. That's what our regulations say. I was just wondering if we did something wrong when we located it there. I can't comment on that. Okay. Um, the other thing to submit with your revision would be the total area of disturbance in the 50 and the 100 yep. existing versus proposed. Please. Say it again. I'm writing it down. Total area of? The total area of disturbance uh, in the 0 to 50 and then the 50 to 100 existing versus proposed. Please. Yep. So you understand we need a better plan that shows the 50 and the 100 and then yep. those measurements. Okay. Yes. Plus, we need some discussion of what happened with the deck and the shower. I made a note on that. Okay. So when would you like to continue to? Uh, at least January 6th, because I have to try and reach out to them. And we've obviously got the holidays and I'm chasing people around. So will that give you enough time? Because we need the paperwork a week before. What is the next time past that? The 20th. Why don't we shoot for the 20th then? Okay. Could I have a motion to continue courier to January 20th, 2021? <laughs> so moved. Over. All right, thank you. A second? Second, John Cumbler. Okay, I need a voice vote. Ben Fairbank? Yes. John Cumbler? Yes. Leon Shreve? Yes. Barbara Branisell? Yes. John Portnoy? Yes. Michael Fisher? Refuse. And Debbie Freeman? Yes. You're all set. We'll see you back on the 20th. Thank you very much. Everybody stay safe. Thank you. All right. Um, Baker and Elsa, Elsa, I'm going to say it wrong. I'm sorry. Elsesser? 210 Kendrick. Avenue, Unit 2, Map 20, Parcel 29B, a notice of intent. Install landscape elements, including driveway, terraces, seat wall, storage shed, steps, pergola, lawn area, and grill. Replace existing fence and revegetate. 
Is anyone here for this? Yes. Yes. Um, I'm, I'm Lauren Cronin. I'm from Gregory Lombardi Design, um, the landscape architects. Uh, Greg Lombardi is also on the call tonight, as well as the property owners, uh, Mark Baker and Janet Elsesser. Hi, everybody. Hi. Hi. Okay. You want to go ahead and talk us through the changes? Yes, absolutely. So, um, so this is, is a continuance. We came before the commission about a month ago in mid-November, and um, the commissioners had a bunch of comments. So we've gone back to the drawing board and um, produced the revised plan that you see in front of you tonight um, that we believe satisfies all of your comments and requests, and we hope will be um, acceptable. So, um, Lauren, do you want to share the plan on the screen with us so we can all be looking at the same plan? You should have access to screen share. Sure. Okay. It just might make it a little bit easier. One second. Perfect. Okay. You all see this? Yes, that's great. Thank okay. You. Um, so also in your packet, you should have a revised survey. Um, the surveyor updated the ACE line, um, so it's more precisely located for the specific property, which allows um, us to give you the most accurate um, calculations on this plan as possible. Um, it's more of a formality, but I wanted to make sure you have that for your records. Um, and you should also have existing conditions photographs and the updated narrative. Um, so, um, just actually, I'm going to go to the um, existing photographs for a second so we can see um, what the existing conditions were like um, prior to the house construction. So, as you can see, the, the previous owners have um, kind of driven on every square inch of this property. They've driven down both sides of the um, cottage. There's a driveway out back in the backyard, and they've also done this like loop driveway through the um, front. So basically resulted in a completely compacted site where there's almost no vegetation that's able to kind of take hold in that. So we're starting with a pretty degraded and disturbed site to begin with. So um, the owners are hoping to, since they've kind of rehabilitated the cottage on the site, they're hoping to do the same with the landscape. Um, and as much as, you know, Kind of restored as much as possible to make it as ecologically functional as possible also. So the goal of the proposed plan is to decompact the site, um, to remediate the kind of existing conditions, plus the additional um, impacts from the construction of the house, and then to, which will kind of restore the soil profile and allow infiltration of rainwater on the site. Um, they'd like to revegetate as much of the site as possible, um, with native plant materials to um, kind of facilitate as much wildlife habitat as possible and also to kind of minimize wind erosion on the site, keep the soils in place. And then um, they would also like to create specific use zones um, so that as they inhabit the property in the coming years and decades that the whole site doesn't get compacted again, that we um, kind of limit vehicular and pedestrian circulation on the site to areas that are designed to kind of withstand those impacts and that um, the planted areas that they're going to go to the effort of installing can be preserved and allowed to function um, to the best of the abilities. So um, the specific things that you had asked us to look at at the last hearing, um, you asked us to reference the approved plans for the um, properties on either side of this, which is unit one and unit three. Um, and both of these came before the commission um, in the last couple of years, I think, and were approved. So we pulled those submissions and we used those as a guide when we were developing the revised plan. Um, you asked that we remove the um, stepping stones from within the 50 foot buffer. We used to have stepping stones that kind of went around the front of the house. So we took those out, um, which allowed us to increase the planted areas in the front, the kind of medium gray color is the, are the planted areas. So um, unit one, which is this property 
um, to the left on this plan, has a really kind of robust pollinator perennial garden in the front. Um, so the clients would like to kind of use that as a guide and recreate something similar on their property. So we have, that's what we have proposed out in front of the house. A lot of native um, materials there. Um, and then we did keep a little bit of turf grass in the front of the house um, because we noted that, that was approved on both of the adjacent um, properties as well. And also because we do have an egress that goes into the 50 foot buffer. So we do need to maintain some sort of walkable surface out there for safety and emergency egress. Um, we did update the plan so that the turf grass mix is called out as a coastal fescue mix, which is in keeping again with what was approved on um, both of the adjacent properties. So as you guys know, um, you know coastal or fescue mix is appropriate for coastal conditions because it's really drought resistant, salt resistant, and um, you know requires less maintenance than the traditional uh, grass mix. And then in the back of the house, you had asked us to reduce the paved areas as much as possible, which um, we believe we have done. Um, the original plan had some stone paving here at the back of the driveway, which then was kind of continuous and wrapped around the back corner of the site. And then the terrace um, back here used to expand pretty much the whole width of the back of the house. So we have um, reduced all that. We got rid of the stone paving in the driveway. So that is now all P stone, which is pervious. Um, so water will just go right through that and down into the soil. Um, this walkway that connects those spaces is now stepping stones. They have planted joints. So again, any water that falls there will go into the joints and be infiltrated um, into the ground. And then we shrunk this rear terrace um, by about 25 to 30%. So it's significantly smaller. It's really, um, really minimal. I think the scale of this plan is maybe deceiving because this lot is so, so tiny that um, although it might look like it's taking up, you know, a big chunk of the rear yard, it's um, literally only big enough for a um, picnic table and enough room to like walk around that. There's no excess um, space back here. So we, we shrunk that in on both sides. We reduced this right side of the terrace. So it's only a walkway right now. So you can, it's much smaller than it was. Um, again, just minimal to be able to get around to the shower. Um, and then we, we did keep the stepping stones around this east side of the house, um, mostly because this is the, going to be the main kind of access from the house to the rear yard. So we think it's important to keep those stones there as a way to um, control where people walk and again, kind of minimize compaction. Um, I think the stones allow us to keep the planting material alive in the joints. Um, we did reduce the size of those stepping stones from the previous iteration of the plan. Um, so that, and we spaced them out more. So there's less stone and more vegetation over on that side that I think is accomplishing the same thing of providing a walkway to get around the side. Um, so those are the, um, those were your comments back to us and that's um, how we address them. And I think that's basically it in a nutshell. So if you have questions, I'm happy to respond. Uh, Michael, I have two questions, Debbie. Go ahead, please. Yes. Number one, the proposed seat wall, is that uh, masonry? What is, what is that? It is a masonry wall, um, and that is kind of doing dual purpose. So um, obviously we need to be able to pitch grade away from the foundation so we don't get water up against the house. So it's allowing us to do that. And it's also acting as the seat for that picnic table that I talked about on two sides, which allows us to really minimize the, the terrace as much as possible, since we don't have to have space to pull out a chair on that side of the table. 
Oh, okay. And the other question, you say existing fence to be replaced? Yes. Uh, I, as I understand it, uh, just looking at it today, there was there's no fence there. So there is a fence, or there there was a fence. It's documented on the survey as an existing condition, and it's also in the um, you can see in the uh, original photographs. It's out in front. It's a kind of post and rope. That's on town land, is it not? Um, yes, I believe it. Yeah, I, I still don't think it's appropriate for a property owner to be placing anything on town land. So including the vegetation. All of the other houses along this road have their fences. Like that's where the fence line is on all these other properties. Debbie, I, I wonder if we can, you know, I, I'm all for native pollinator plantings, but but I had the same question about the fence. And I wondered if we have the authority to uh, to approve the construction of a fence and plantings on town-owned property that they're not the applicant. Right, I don't think we do. Hillary? I'm sorry, you're muted. Yeah, no, I, I was saying I had to unmute. Um, what I was gonna say is that split rail fencing such as this is not truly subject to the Wetlands Protection Act. Um, that being said, these folks can pursue the installation of that fence with a use of town property permit if they so desire. So I don't think we need to get hung up on the fence so much tonight. Okay, what about the planting on town land? I guess I, I sort of agree with John that any planting is better than, than no planting, especially in this location. Um, I think we can make a note to the selectmen that we've approved this um, and we feel it's va a valuable addition. I mean, the town isn't gonna do anything to that piece of property. Um, they're certainly not gonna maintain it or plant anything nice there that's gonna help the environment. So um, understanding that it is on town property, you know, should the town run it over with a dump truck, then we run it over with a dump truck. But I mean. Do they need to file an application for the fence and the use of the property that they wanna revegetate? I think that would be the process, the use of town property process. So it, that's a you know notification to the selectmen, and you would talk to the um, executive assistant to to spell out that process more clearly. Okay. Are there other comments about the project from the commissioners? We also asked, I think, about the existing shower or the, the shower that was just put in. Is that drained in, in what way? Um, I'm not sure. That was part of the previous um, NOI for the house. So there is a dry well. There is a dry well that was designed along with it. Okay, thank you. Are there any other commissioner questions? I, mean, uh, I have a question. Okay. I, I think they they okay. I'm sorry, I don't know who was first. Deb, call on one of us. It looks Leon. like Joe Leon, now. go ahead. Okay, I'm, I, I actually am impressed that they made, uh, took in consideration all the comments we had last time. I think in the issue of the fence, not our business, the plantings, I think we can say we're, we, support, but we can't give permission for planning on town property. I think that it's reasonable for them to put in the proposed stepping stones um, in, that they have proposed in the back and along the side so that they're not um, tracking sand into their house unnecessarily as long as the stepping stones are separated so they don't create too much of a, um, a, a obstruction to water seeping in the ground. I like this plan. I think they've done a nice job with very limited space and they've, they've been considerate of our suggestions. So I propose that we accept with the condition that we can't give them permission to do anything on town property, but we don't object to their plannings. Barbara?
Barbara, did uh, you I was actually going to say the same thing. I have a condition <laughs> that they get approval from the town for the planting and the fence. Pardon? Okay. All right. Then if can you hear me? Yes, we heard you. Um, any other comments from the public? Am, am, I, am, I, am I being heard? Yes, would you state your name, please? Sure, I'm Richard Michaud and I'm the owner of the uh, Cottage One. Okay. And I wanted to say that I'm uh, very much in, worked with the bakers and seen what they've done. It's the same architect that I had and they've shared with me all, all the stuff that they're doing and I'm in close proximity and I think they've done a marvelous job over there. And everybody is ecologically conscious as well. Um, and I'll just tell you an interesting twist on the ownership of the town road, by the way. The truth is the owners uh, own that and we gave an easement long ago to the town. So the town has an easement on property owned by the owners. Probably doesn't change anything you're saying. It's just curious how that happened because the town took it back in the 40s. But that's irrelevant to, it's just an interesting point. Uh, but I do want to say I, I'm very pleased with where their, what their project is. And I hope everybody thinks that those three cottages that have been renovated uh, are an improvement to what was there before. Thank you. Anyone else from the public? All right, could I have a motion, please? I move that we accept the new proposal for Kendrick Avenue, whatever the address is. Kendrick Avenue, Unit 2, Map 90, Parcel 29B. Correct. Is there a second? second? Michael. Okay. I need a voice vote. Michael Fisher? Yes. Barbara Branisell? Yes. Ben Fairbank? Yes. John Cumbler? Yes. John Portnoy? Yes. Leon Shreve? Yes. And Debbie Freeman? Yes. Did I miss anyone? I don't think so. Okay, you're all set. Thank, Thank you, you very so much. much. And we there really is appreciate it. We really appreciate it. I don't know if you got me, but my internet, uh, so this is going in and out. Okay, we did get you, Barbara. And, and I, I'm the supervisor for, the, for that building, so I, should be the, so I should be the supervisor for this as well. Perfect. And you understand there's a condition that you, you speak with the town and make the appropriate application. We do. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Thanks so much, everybody. We really appreciate it. That was great. Okay. Thank you. Thank you all. The next matter, sheets um, 120. Order of conditions form. Go okay. ahead. All right. The next matter is sheets 125 Marvin Way, map 21, parcel 26. It's an NOI for tree removal, repair walkways, expand deck, construct small platform removal of trees and pruning for view corridor. That has been continued at the applicant's request to 1-6-2021. Could I have a motion to continue? So moved, Michael. So moved. Second. Leon, second. I need just need a quick voice vote on that. John Portnoy? Yes. John Cumbler? Yes. Ben Fairbank? Yes. Leon Shreve? Yes. Barbara Brennesell. I'm sorry, was that a yes? Just give me a thumbs up. Okay. Um, Michael Fisher? Yes. Okay. And Debbie Freeman, yes. That's all set. Okay. Then the next matter we have is Callahan, 149 Commercial Street, Map 21, Parcel 120. It's a notice of intent to raise and replace a portion of an existing family dwelling and a deck addition. Is anyone here for Callahan? Yes, uh, David Little from Ryder and Wilcox. Okay, do you wanna explain, to walk us through this project, please? Yes, thank you. So I'm representing April Callahan, the owner of the property. And as, as noted in, in your description, she, wishes to remove the easterly L on the rear of the building and replace it with a new, um, a new addition. The work for that would occur solely within the existing footprint. 
uh, it would be a slab so that there would be uh, a new slab so that there would be minimal disturbance and digging around, around that. The, the foundation itself will be Comathena compliant. We, will, we are required uh, by both state building code and FEMA to install flood vents because that portion of their property is located within uh, flood zone AE, uh, elevation 14. So the, the disturbance would be a temporary disturbance. The flood vents, I think, would be an improvement to the site. Um, obviously, the, the homeowner would hope that she would never see floodwaters up to that elevation. But because it has been mapped to that elevation, she is required to put them in. So uh, it, it would provide uh, a mechanism through which the floodwaters would be able to enter the basement and exit. The basement can only be used for storage. Uh, all mechanicals and equipment servicing the dwelling would be on the upper story. We are also proposing a deck off, off of that the deck would be elevated approximately nine feet off the ground, uh, adjacent, immediately adjacent to the very large maple. The very large maple is plant is intended to stay. It's a shaded area. Um, so that it doesn't get that much sun to begin with. So I would expect that the deck being curvious and being nine feet off the ground um, would not have any significant impact on, on the resource area and it wouldn't be an impediment to wildlife movement or anything like that across the property. We have um, shown the proposed limit of work to essentially follow the easterly edge of the gravel drive and parking areas, which would allow them staging areas for trucks and things like that. And in the gravel drive, so it wouldn't be, they wouldn't be disturbing any other lawn areas. The, um, I think that that, that is, that, that's pretty much my presentation. So I, I would like to open it up to questions from the commissioners at the, this point, if I may. Thank you. Um, I, on your plan, do you have any idea where the 50 foot and 100 foot lines would be? Because I don't see them. I see the A, C, E. Yes. Yeah, so um, interestingly enough, the, the slope of the landform where the flood zone 14 intersects it is between a four to one slope and a 10 to one slope. So mm -hmm. by definition, the flood zone is a coastal bank and the 50 foot buffer to that is landward of the front porch of the house. It is shown on our site plan. Okay, I must be missing it. It's it's on the it's it, it's between the house and Commercial Street, right? It's near Commercial Street. Okay, got it, got it. So what we're talking about is all within the fifty foot buffer, then. It within the fifty foot buffer and within land subject to coastal storm flowage. Yes. Okay, now walk me through the use of the slab. We've recently had an issue with the use of a slab at another dwelling. Will there be pilings underneath the slab? No, the slab, the slab would be, so the, the situate, the, the existing dwelling or the existing addition and concrete slab would be removed. We would come in and around the perimeter of the slab, we would pour a four foot frost wall and then the slab would be poured within that four foot frost wall and it would be poured at the existing grade of 11.97. Okay, and We're how not much- proposing any, any grade changes on the site. How much was it, will it weigh approximately? So that we know if it shifts what we're talking about. Well, the, one of the reasons that you're required to pour a four foot frost wall is just for that reason, it goes down below the potential frost depth. Um, that's why water mains are installed more than over four to five feet below grade. So um, I, I can tell you this, this will not, this will not shift. It, it will be, 
it will be very, very stable. It'll, it'll be more stable than what presently exists. Debbie, I have a question. Michael, go ahead, please. Okay, so according to our regulations, the total disturbance within the, the buffer zone is a total of 5,000 square feet, including houses, cottages, lawns, gravel driveways. Uh, I can see replacing the L, because that doesn't increase it, but the deck is not only toward the water from the building, which is not permitted, and also is, I think you've already far exceeded your, your capacity within the 5,000 square feet. Do you have a number of disturbance on this property? I, I, I do not have a number. The 5,000 okay. square feet, does that include lawn area? Yes. So yeah, um, I, I, would, I would expect that, um, yes, in fact, we, we do exceed that number. I, I think the- okay. We need an exact, pursuant to our regulations, we need an exact calculation of the number of disturbed feet presently and the number of disturbed feet you're suggesting with the deck in addition and the removal of part of the house. Well, there, there is no, there is a net, no net change with the addition. Okay, but we, we so need- So the debt, the, the, only, the only increase would be the, um, the, the deck, which, which constitutes uh, 324 square Okay, but we need the total figured. We need okay. to know what that is to see if you okay. are in the 5,000 square feet or over. So is there is there any recourse to um, if if you exceed the five thousand square feet? There's a variance possible, but we need to know what we're looking at first and how far you already are out of line. Okay, and if if I may, since um, it looks like we're going to be continuing this, if if if, if I determine that the deck um, exceeds the 5,000 square feet. Well, I, so it, essentially, Hillary, if you could help me out with this. So we have the, the concrete uh, wall down near the marsh. Would you say everything from the concrete wall to Commercial Street has been altered on this site because it, it's all lawn, driveway? I don't. It, yeah, I, we can't hear you. Hillary. Yeah, I know, I know, I know. Um, I wouldn't get hung up on the lawn area. I would get hung up on the gravel pathways, um, walkways, cottages, those types of components. Okay, I just wanted to know how to calculate it. Okay. Now, uh, uh, one couple. Go ahead, Michael. Then John Cumbler. Then Barbara. Yes, one complication. The house, I think, was originally built around 1850, so it predates the rules. I don't know if, it, if the house needs to be included or not. I think it's, our regulation talks about total disturbance on the site. Right, right, no matter when it was constructed. Okay, John Kumpler? I, I, I think that it's somewhat a mute point because it's unlikely the committee is going to approve the deck, the new deck, because the new deck is within the 50 foot um, buffer zone. Um, I have no prop personally, I have no problem with the removal of the old dwelling and to replace with the new dwelling that that's, uh, meets the FEMA requirements. I think it's unlikely that the committee is going to accept the new deck. So in that case, I don't, I don't know how relevant the area of disturbance is unless we're gonna talk about um, the new deck. I think we still want to see that number calculated on the plan. Um, it's something we ask for on each and every submission. So I don't, um, <coughs> whether you approve the deck or not, we still wanna see the area of disturbance. And just circling back to the deck, um, the deck is not on ground level. It looks like it's several feet in the air. Nine, nine feet in the air, Hillary. Nine feet in the air. And it, it's affixed to the ground by 
how many sauna tubes and posts do we? There would be nine sauna tubes and posts. Nine sauna tubes and posts. Okay, thank you. Barbara? I agree with what John said and our regulations specifically say the following activities are prohibited within the 50 foot filter strip. Um, expansion of existing structures included but not limited to homes, buildings, garage, sheds, and decks. That seems pretty clear to me. Could you cite the number for the regulations so that he'll uh, Whoops. Okay, let me go back to it. Sorry. Um, that's uh, section 2.01, buffer zone, including the filthy 50 foot strip. All right, so you're gonna need to continue. Well, if, if, I, if I may, Madam Chair, if, um, could I request that the um, commission approve this subject to the receipt of a plan with no proposed deck in just the existing, what we wouldn't, if, if forget, if just give me one second, please. We, we are, we're not gonna be changing any numbers, whatever the number of disturbances on the site it is. And if we're not doing the deck, we would not be changing that. So okay. my, I'm, you, I'm just trying to save the commission time and myself time. So would, would it be reasonable to ask to, for approval of this subject to the remove a, new, a revised plan showing no deck and the existing coverage numbers. It, it's, well, it seems. Let me explain. I don't feel comfortable. This is me personally going ahead without having those coverage numbers before we talk at all. The reason being if the property as it looks is well over the number then I think we have to talk about what, if anything, can be removed from the property. Well, I don't think I don't think it may be, Ms. Freeman. I think it. it, it I'm just trying to save both the commission and the client mm. time here. I think if we're not changing anything and working with within the existing footprint, not changing any numbers. If I just give you the number and remove the deck, I'm kind of hearing that the project is permittable. I'm saying to you that I don't know. I don't know how much of this property is covered in disturbed area and that we may want something in addition to what you're proposing. That's my personal feeling. So I don't wanna approve. I, I, I know, I'm just asking, can I hear from the other commissioners? Of course. Barbara? Yes, I... I'm sorry, Barbara's talking and she's muted. We can't hear you, Barbara. And I'm having a lot of trouble with connectivity today. Um, I would agree with David. It would save a lot of time. It would save another hearing to approve it with the condition that the deck be removed and that the new plan has the square footage of disturbance on it. I agree with that, uh, Barbara. Michael Fisher, you had a question? Yes, I was just saying, I, I largely go along with that. There is a... Uh, a stone fire pit right at the edge of the concrete wall. And that seems something that if we had to remove something, that would be something that would be removable. But I agree that without the deck, it's a much stronger proposal. John Portnoy? Yeah, I would, I would agree with, uh, with the idea of approving it without the deck, except that I wanted to put out there that um, we could require some mitigated plantings along the just above the concrete wall because that's totally bare down to the marsh and you know natural marshes have a shrub border so if we could establish some shrubs there i'm not i'm sorry to present a guessing game but i can't tell you how many but you need to propose that i think so we would need a plan with with shrubs that would survive a bit of salt spray there Ben uh, yeah, I would I would actually agree with John on that. If there, I, does that does that mean if we if we requested a planting plan, would that have to be continued, or could we add that as a condition? I I think the planting plan would have to come back to us so that we could take a look at it. But couldn't um, David work with um, Hillary or Doug on that, or? 
I'm just trying to save some steps here. Yeah, yeah I think it's reasonable. Um, we can work with David on a planting plan with the mitigation of a shrub border. We've done this on a number number of other properties, and I'm happy to review whatever they submit. And Leon, did you have comments? Oh, I just wanted to say that I think that uh, since the deck is is not really uh, permitted, that the suggestion of re resubmitting the plan with a or or just have that be a condition is fine. Could I have a motion then? I move that we accept this with the conditions that the deck be removed and they come back with the plan that has the area of disturbance uh, in it and also a planting uh, regiment that's that they clear with Hillary. Is there a second? Again, John. <clears throat> just can I have a clarification? When you say come back, you mean just submit it to Hillary, not come right. before the commission again? Just to Hillary, right. All right. I need a voice vote. John Portnoy? Yes. Ben Fairbank? Yes. Michael Fisher? Yes. John Cumbler? Yes. Leon Shreve? Yes. Barbara Bredesel? Yes. And Debbie Freeman, no, you're all set. Thank you very much. And I'll, I'll be in touch with you soon, Hillary. Needs a, a supervisor, I think. No? Yes. I, I, can, I, I can look at that one. Oh, okay. I was going to say, we, John, we can, John, we, oh, do you know when it's going to happen? David? It, as soon as possible, John. I may be able, I, I, I'm going to be away for. A, a bit, so I'm probably not the best person. I'll do it. Okay, John Cumbler will be the supervisor. And you'll contact me. Very well. And okay. Fill out your forms. <laughs> I will. Thank you, Barbara. Okay. All right. Simone, 5 and 11, Samoset Avenue, Map 28, Parcels 186 and 185, a notice of intent, proposed shorefront. Uh, thank you, Madam. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. My name is Charlie Agro with Postal Engineering Company. And I'd like to request to present this project as well as the uh, following project, which is at 21 Samoset Ave as a one presentation, since it's essentially the same project across two properties. And that's Mitchelson Trustees? Uh, that's correct, yes, uh, Michelson Trustees. Thank you, go ahead, please. Okay, thank you. Uh, the proposed project is to construct a rock revetment across the coastal bank of the properties uh, 21 and 11 Samoset Avenue. The uh, proposal would include tying into the rock revetment that's existing uh, to the south at uh, 5 Samoset Avenue. The uh, both properties are located along Indian Neck, which is adjacent to Wellfleet Harbor. Uh, most of the properties along the stretch uh, are already protected by coastal engineering structures. There's a, a series of uh, a zigzagging seawalls to the north, as well as other uh, rock revetments along uh, basically the entire shoreline. Uh, these two properties are some of the uh, only remaining properties along the entire uh, stretch of shoreline here, not prevent, protected by any form of a uh, coastal engineering structure currently. Um, there actually is evidence of a uh, historic coastal engineered structure at the site. That's the uh, wooden structure that is, uh, appears to be uh, pretty old, that is uh, still somewhat intact. It appears that it uh, was probably a uh, timber seawall at one point. And uh, it also, if you uh, go back on Google Earth, it appears that it's in line with some of the other uh, concrete structures to the north. And if you uh, walk the beach, you'll actually find remnants of that uh, old timber wall as far north as 77 Samoset Avenue, which just goes to show that there was likely a uh, timber seawall all the way across the shoreline at one point. Um, the proposed project is to construct uh, revetments across both properties. 
The uh, revetment along the bank at 21 Samoset would be 85 feet long. And the uh, revetment along the property at 11 Samoset Avenue would be 67 feet long. Uh, included with the proposal on the uh, shown on the attached plans is uh, installing granite block steps built into the rock revetment um, for both property owners to access the site. And the uh, steps at 21 Samoset would be uh, uh, basically uh, built into so you can use the uh, top section of timber steps. There would be a landing from the uh, top section of the timber steps and then uh, where the revetment begins, it would be uh, a granite block step, so shown in the plans. Access to the site would be from uh, Omaha Road or Nauset Road. Uh, in this case, Omaha Road is preferred because it's closer to the site. Uh, just last spring for the nourishment project, which took place at 21 Samoset Ave, we used the uh, Omaha Road access and, and that worked out very well. Um, Omaha Road is a uh, private road, so we would obtain uh, authorization from the owners prior to using it and make sure that the road was restored to the pre-construction uh, status uh, after construction. Um, also proposed as part of the rock revetment is a uh, beach uh, nourishment and monitoring program. Uh, as uh, discussed at the hearing last spring for uh, beach nourishment at 21 Samoset Avenue, uh, uh, Wellfleet Harbor is uh, relatively sensitive to uh, beach nourishment type projects uh, given uh, the uh, vast shellfish resources within the harbor. Um, so we don't want to, we want to make sure we don't over nourish certain areas. I uh, calculated the nourishment uh, for that would be uh, potentially lost from the uh, rock revetment for each property. And that would be 25 cubic yards at 21 Samoset and 20 cubic yards at 11 Samoset. Um, the uh, a beach monitoring program can be uh, implemented where a uh, engineer would uh, either conduct a survey or uh, install benchmarks and measure down from the benchmarks to the beach grade to determine if uh, the beach has eroded to uh, below what the uh, beach level is before construction. And if so, uh, nourishment can be placed. Uh, we outlined the alternatives, uh, and it's included with the alternatives analysis uh, as part of the notice of intent. If there's any questions, I'd be happy to answer the alternatives. Um, the resources uh, within the project area are Coastal Beach and Coastal Bank. Uh, the Coastal Beach will not have any uh, long-term adverse impacts due to the beach nourishment uh, program. If, uh, beach ner if the beach does erode, um, triggering the uh, need for uh, beach uh, nourishment along the revetment. Uh, the beach, will, the uh, revetment will be nourished as previously uh, stated, and the coastal bank uh, will be uh, benefited because the rock revetment will provide additional stability and help reduce erosion along the bank. And the uh, bank will continue to supply the beach with sediment through the uh, nourishment program. And uh, at this point, I'd be happy to answer any questions that you may have. Hillary, we had discussed obtaining an expert to review sea walls and to look at the issue of sand transport and the impact that a seawall would have at a particular location. I'd like to request that we obtain an independent expert to review this project. Sure. That would take a vote of the commission. Okay, could I have a motion? So moved, Michael. May I ask a question first? Sure. Um, how far is each dwelling from the top of the coastal bank? Yes, as uh, shown on the uh, site plan, um, each dwelling is uh, just about 25 feet away from the coastal bank. The uh, property uh, 21 Samoset, there's a uh, portion of the structure that uh, overhangs. Uh, beyond and into the 25-foot uh, uh, buffer from the coastal bank. And uh, at 11 Samoset Avenue, the existing deck is uh, right up against the 25-foot uh, uh, buffer to the bank. Thank you. Thank you. So I will, I will move that we... Um, I, I have think a question. question. Okay. More questions. John Kumbler? Yeah. Um, what, when were the two houses built, at the two properties? I think um, we can get into that right after we do the expert. If it... I'm not trying to cut you off. I'm just saying that they're two different issues. 
So would you be willing to hold your question, please? Okay. Now, I, I do have one uh, quick question and uh, kind of statement to make here. Um, if uh, has a uh, has a third party uh, expert uh, looked into the project yet, or you guys haven't already requested somebody to look at the project? No, we have not. We can't do that. So my only concern is this public hearing in front of us and vote on it in public hearing on, at the time of the issue. No, I, I understand that and appreciate that. Um, but this project has already been uh, delayed, which of course, due to uh, a terrible situation here in the uh, global pandemic, um, this project has been delayed since uh, mid-June and it would have, uh, uh, you know, I think it would have been great to have uh, requested that third party uh, review during that time period here. And now we're coming into the winter season where uh, if we could uh, move forward with this project, we can uh, protect the coastal bank and uh, help protect these houses against uh, further erosion, which as we saw last spring, the erosion became pretty significant in an area where there hasn't been uh, a lot of erosion over the years. And my biggest concern last year was a relatively mild year as well. Uh, all through the spring, it was pretty mild up until April. All of a sudden, the uh, both properties lost significant uh, amount of the uh, toe of the coastal bank there, especially uh, at 21 Samoset Ave, where the beach access there has got eroded. So my concern with this is what would the time frame be and how long would this hearing have to get continued uh, before we can move forward with this again? Hillary, do you have any comment yeah, on that? Yeah, well, unfortunately, we're at a rough time right now, right? Because there's a whole week of holidays and vacation time and um, that sort of thing. Um, I imagine we would get someone on board pretty quickly. Um, we then have to notify the selectmen that we're, you know, using a third party reviewer and we have to agree to some terms for that with you and your clients. And um, I would say maybe a two month time period. Yeah, now again, I mean, that puts us out to uh, another winter where this uh, rock revetment won't be installed, where if the uh, project would be heard on time, which of course I appreciate this is a, a difficult situation here. Um, w we would have been able to construct this rock revetment before this winter. And at, at this point, you know, I know the, uh, the commission's heard shorefront protection projects. I think I've presented, presented a few in the past. Um, why is there a need for a uh, third party witness to uh, provide a testimony or to review the project when uh, I think everybody here has uh, experience with uh, um, reviewing these types of projects here? And is there any specific aspect to this project that uh, raises any uh, uh, cause for a concern, and uh, is there anything that we can go over now to try to move forward without a uh, third party review? Barbara? Well, our regulations allow us to permit CESs um, if it can be shown that they will have no significant adverse impact on adjacent or nearby coastal beaches, coastal banks, coastal dunes, salt marsh, land containing shellfish or other seawood wetland resource areas. And also we're concerned about neighboring properties and we're not engineers. So we cannot make these kinds of determinations. At least I don't feel that I can. And we, it's very helpful to us to have someone else uh, give us input on, on these projects. So that's why we need uh, another person, another party weighing in on this. And I understand that. And the first part of that regulation where it stated that as long as no uh, adverse effects were made to the uh, nearby adjacent areas. Uh, in this case, we're only dealing with Coastal Bank and uh, Coastal Beach. Uh, there's no dune, there is no salt marsh within the project site or 100 feet from it. Um, you know, we do have, uh, uh, we are well above the mean high water line, uh, which means there'll be limited impacts to shellfish. The only time there'll be any impact is when we have uh, severe storms associated with storm surge and higher high tides that'll reach the rock revetment, which at that point, again, this is a uh, completely armored shoreline here. And, and I'm looking at the plans, the topography and being on the site, 
I think that the uh, uh, as shown from the uh, from looking at five Samoset Avenue as and to eleven Samoset Avenue, you can see where there is uh, erosion along the end of the uh, other rock revetment uh, pretty substantially. The last time I was on site, there was about an eight foot drop right in that location. So I just uh, and, and as I stated too, we would uh, conduct annual monitoring of uh, the the beach, the rock revetments. Uh, to ensure that uh, um, nourishment, if required, would be placed. So I'm just not sure that there are any adverse impacts here. The uh, rock revetment would be tying into a neighboring revetment on one side, and on the other side, it would be uh, 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 tapering into the bank 30 feet away from the property line. So for that reason, where uh, that 30-foot setback from the proposed rock revetment to the property line is uh, greater than the uh, required by the uh, Town of Wellfleet bylaw. And, and so again, I just think that uh, this rock revetment was designed uh, very uh, um, carefully to meet all of the uh, state and local uh, wetland regulations here. And I, I'm just, I would like to hear what anybody's uh, specific concerns would be rather than that it's a rock revetment. Well, I would just add, we had a discussion with your company, um, oh, maybe a month or so ago, and we had agreed at that time that we would hear these cases and that one of our requirements would be for the third party review. So I don't think this is new information um, to coastal engineering because we had this conversation that in order for the commissioners to feel comfortable they were not all out at the site. Um, some of them are not comfortable traveling because of COVID. And this is an option that is available for commissioners to invoke when they feel the need to have additional reviews. So I think we've had a number of problems um, assessing beach nourishment amounts based on erosion rates. We've had issues um, with the end and scour and where <clears throat> where's the best place to put the nourishment. Um, whether there's another end treatment that might be better to preserve the end of the property on number 21. Sometimes we think that quar rolls are better there. So I think there are some additional considerations for us. We've seen beach elevations drop when we install these structures. So I, I think it doesn't hurt to get a third party review. And if all is designed, um, accordingly and and there are no issues then you move forward right away there's no additional delay so unfortunately this pandemic has caused us all to suffer i mean we like to all go out to the site together and and have a look and meet with you guys out there and understand projects better but we just aren't in a capacity to do that right now so if this is a way to get this project approved and permitted then i think it's it's the right choice and I do hear that. I, I appreciate all that. And I was not part of that phone call. So I, uh, that is new news to me. Um, and, and I mean, you know, I guess my, my only, my biggest issue with this is just that it, for, as for the owner's sake, we've been waiting to have this hearing since uh, June, mid June. And uh, for the for the hearing to be basically open and shut, we, we can't do anything about this until we get a third party reviewer. Um, personally, just a little bit, and I'm not even the owner here, I'm a little bit frustrated that that couldn't have taken place back in mid-June. That's, I guess, I, my only I, issue. I explained to you, we cannot do that unless it's in a public hearing with everybody present. We're well, that public hearing could have happened in mid-June. Uh, we could not do that because we were not prepared to handle rock revetments. They were too complex. We have well, done our best to, with the conditions that we're under. And all due respect, I, I guess my, my only point is not prepared to say we need a third party review at that point. I and mean, again, I, I don't wanna stress this to the point of, uh, uh, of, of being ridiculous, but I just wanna make the point that I guess it would have been great to have started this review back in June. It would have gave the third party person uh, months to take a look and have a really good understanding of the plan um, but I guess we have to move forward however we can. Are there other comments from the commissioners? And then I'll call on you, Mr. O'Connor. Oh. Anybody else? Would the commission be open to hearing um, uh, 
about adding more nourishment to the property through the winter if they can't uh, get their structure completed. Is that something that you would like to talk about or? Yeah, we can talk about that. And I want to hear from Mr. O'Connor and Ms. Chavetta also. Um, Mr. O'Connor? O'Connell, Debbie. O'Connell, I'm so sorry. No problem. <laughs> I, I, how have the commission and, and how has the engineer considered Sewell's gutter and the water flow into Sewell's gutter? Uh, I'd, I'd be very concerned if uh, a whole bunch of sand comes up and cuts off the circulation into that. So is that going to be some consideration by the by the? Commission? I think the third party expert would have to look at sand transport at that particular location and um, deal with the properties that are nearby. I think that's a very good point. Well, to answer Mr. O'Connell's uh, question from my uh, perspective, uh, we have considered that and uh, we designed the, the beach nourishment profile previously. Uh, so again, it was well above the mean high water line with a steady slope so that uh, if in case uh, the water did reach it, uh, erosion levels would be uh, uh, on a lower level. And actually, uh, in looking at some pictures that I've seen recently of the beach there, it looks like the uh, nourishment has held up pretty well. Uh, not to say that as soon as we get a really big storm, that nourishment may all wash away. But in that, uh, in that scenario, that nourishment was 100, uh, give or take cubic yards, 100 or 150 cubic yards. 150 cubic yards picked up by a uh, nor'easter storm, such as uh, this one we may be hit with today into tomorrow, dispersed over uh, a large area would have little effect on a uh, area such as Saul's gutter here. Uh, there's sand from adjacent beaches that uh, may uh, quantify to become you know, uh, thousands of cubic yards of sand. So the uh, 100 or so cubic yards along the toe of the bank in this location uh, wouldn't really affect it or uh, have an adverse effect on water flow in and out of the gutter. Um, if we did place too much nourishment, you, you could eventually have that scenario, but uh, we wouldn't propose placing more than whatever was uh, required to maintain the existing profile at the properties. John Portnoy? Yeah, I have a couple of questions. Um, on the, on uh, both of these submissions and others I've seen on in the Wilderness Protection Act <clears throat> Form 3, um, B, Section B, buffer zone resource area impacts. Why, why isn't, um, if the revetment is on the bank, why isn't the uh, coastal bank checked as a resource area that's impacted? That's uh, what page question. are you looking at there? Pardon? I'm sorry, what page on the uh, wetland? It's, uh, page four on the WPA form three. Page four. So we do have coastal bank uh, checked off with 85 linear feet of proposed alteration. Oh, it's not on mine. I don't know if that's, uh, that's weird. Well, uh, let me just, that's procedural. Let me ask uh, my other more important question. I, I disagree that um, an armored coastal bank with nourishment is equivalent functionally to um, a natural coastal bank <clears throat> because importantly, a natural coastal bank retreats and the beach retreats along with it. So my question is, how do you, how do you decide, as an engineer, how do you decide where in the landward seaward sea profile <clears throat> to build a revetment? Um, you know, if you, if you move it further landward, I understand you, the, pr the property owner loses some upland. <coughs> you also would you accommodate um, more sea level rise. You prolong the useful life of the structure you provide more beach at high tides, and you also reduce sand erosion that can cause problems elsewhere, like on shellfish beds. So how do you decide where to, where to put the coastal structure in that landward seaward sea direction? Yeah, so typically to uh, decide where to install the uh, rock revetment is where the uh, coastal bank is showing signs of severe erosion and failure. Uh, which at this case is a bit, you, it's uh, apparent at the uh, scarping section of the uh, coastal bank now. Um, but by uh, excavating the uh, coastal bank to try to uh, install a revetment further landward uh, may destabilize the bank further 
and create a uh, if the coastal as the coastal bank continues to slope in the slope in the upward direction, you may actually have to uh, construct the revetment so it's higher. So that's uh, another thing that was considered in the design here. Uh, one of the uh, uh, Wellfleet bylaws for the uh, Wetland Protection Act uh, states that the elevation and the length of the uh, revetment should be minimum should be designed so that's the minimal amount uh, required to uh, protect the uh, upland property, uh, which was done here. Okay, but but today we're we're more aware of sea level rise and accelerating sea level sea level rise, and I think that you know we're we're more sensitive to trying to accommodate that. So it's I think our perspective is shifting a bit. We can talk about that more with with third party help. I think. Well, now the, the uh, rock revetments can be, uh, they're, they're structures, but they're uh, also dynamic in that you can uh, 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 make additions to them fairly easily. If you need to build up higher along the top of the bank, you can. Um, if you need to uh, reconstruct or remove some stones, you can as well. And that's where a uh, rock revetment is a, uh, a, a, a you know, good living structure, whereas uh, vertical walls have their uh, limitations as well. But... Uh, um, in, in this case, the uh, revetment was designed to be the uh, minimum height necessary to uh, restabilize the bank as well as the uh, minimum width and, and length across the uh, bank as well. Okay. Um, at this point, John, why don't you go ahead and ask your questions? I'm sorry I cut you off before. We might as well get everything out on the table before we proceed to whether we're going to have an expert or not. John Cumbler, you wanted to ask about the pre-1978 issue. Exactly. How old are the houses? So the houses were both built before uh, 1978. I don't have the exact uh, dates of construction on me. I think... Uh, no, 20... I, Nicholson was rebuilt. And the yes, but it was within the exact same, but within the same footprint of the uh, previously constructed house, which was in the 60s. I believe it was uh, 60... Uh, 68 uh, or something uh, around that time frame here. I, I believe uh, uh, he may, the owner of the property may even be on the call too, if he wants to chime in. Yes, let's hear from him. Yeah, uh, this is Alan Michelson. Uh, th the house was built in the 1950s. Okay, and the rebuilding- and I, I, believe, I believe Mr. Simone's house was likewise built in the 1950s. And when you rebuilt your house, when was that, please? Uh, that was in the, uh, um, uh, uh, 2009. And was it rebuilt on exactly the same footprint? Where was it rebuilt? On the same footprint. Okay. Obviously with, with uh, zoning board, Wellfleet zoning board approval and, and conservation commission approval. John, did you have further questions? No, that was my question. Okay. Given everything we've talked about, do I have a motion or could I have a motion regarding the expert? I'm sorry, did you want to say something, Mr. Michelson? Well, I think just if I could put some context here, and I apologize if this, will, this is already crystal clear to you, but um, when we asked for our emergency um, beach nourishment, which you approved in, uh, I don't remember the exact month, but June or so, um, our stairway to the beach was literally sort of dangling in the air. There was dramatic erosion. So when you, and I believe some of you at least did a site visit then, and you can see the photos in, in what's uh, presented. The, the dangling I'm referring to is in, uh, for example. We included it in the uh, performance standards. It's uh, page. It's figure three, actually, uh, picture three. But my point is that, you know, as I'm sure you appreciate, what you saw when you did the site visit today was what it looks like after the, the emergency nourishment you allowed us to do. I have little doubt that with a big winter storm, that sand will just disappear and it will look like it did before and worse, which was losing about uh, five feet of the embankment. It just slid into the, into the water. So for us, uh, you know, it's, an emergency situation um, that was temporarily mitigated by your approval before of the uh, sand renourishment, but we have no doubt that that will just uh, 
that sand will disappear in a big in a big storm again. Hillary, we don't have an emergency certification order before us, do we? Or request? No, we do not, but we have seen emergency certifications for all kinds of projects recently. So if um, you indeed feel this is an emergency, there are other avenues that you could choose to go. Um, that being said, I think if a, a threat is imminent, you're still 25 feet, your dwelling, which is the imminent threat, is still 25 feet from the top of the coastal bank. Um, Charlie, what's the erosion rate out there? What, what, I mean, what? I uh, would have to look into the report for the CZM published uh, erosion rate, but I agree with Alan. I mean, during those uh, April storms of last year, I think he lost about uh, five feet of uh, coastal bank, and that was over the course of uh, a couple weeks, and not maybe even a couple weeks. It was early April to uh, uh, just about mid-April. There were three nor'easters in a row, coupled with some storm surge that really uh, did a number on the bank. So if you calculated your short-term erosion rate, maybe, um, and your dwelling is still 25 feet back, I mean, we're, we're asking for something that's a couple months out as far as getting it reviewed to make sure it's the best solution. Um, you could apply for an emergency certification for something else in the meantime to hold that bank. Um, well, I think what Alan was referring to in the emergency was the uh, emergency certification for nourishment last year. I don't think we're right now looking for a, uh, we're not currently at applying for a emergency certification for this work. I think he was just referencing the uh, previous emergency certification that we obtained for nourishment, which was last June. Yeah, I, I understand. I, I just think that nourishment is still on the table, obviously, as a solution if something becomes imminent. Um, I think what I'm trying to say is I'm not so sure something's going to become imminent in the time we get this project reviewed and um, get it permitted to the satisfaction of the commission. I know it's not palatable to you um, and your consultant, but I think it is something that makes the commission feel more comfortable with these types of projects where we have experienced issues in the past. So um, you're not the first one. You're certainly not going to be the last one. And Michael, can I, I make a small point? Go ahead, Michael. Yes. Uh, would you please uh, have from the Simone property, there's a dinghy right on top of the vegetation at the top of the coastal bank. And if you're very concerned about it eroding, you probably don't want to store vessels on top of it. Okay. Um, could I have a motion, please, regarding the third party expert? I believe I already made the motion. Okay, I'm sorry. Could I have a second? Second. I'll second. Okay, I need a voice vote. How do you vote, Michael? Yes. John Portnoy? Yes. Ben Fairbank? I'm sorry, I couldn't hear you. He's muted. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Leon Shreve? Yes. Barbara Brennison? Yes. Yes. John Cumbler has stepped out, it looks like. And Debbie Freeman, yes. Did Nancy Cusetta so, want to say anything? She is on the line. Um, I would just say that I'm 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 pleased with trying to get a, a third party evaluation of this project. I think it's the right thing to do, and I I don't have anything to add that I haven't heard commission members uh, say. So I thank you for your diligence. Thank you. So we're going to need a continuance on this project. And we will move as expeditiously as possible from our side to get the third party expert. Yes. Well, I appreciate that. And uh, thank you all for your time. Okay, we need a date though for continuing. Well, I think, I think we should continue indefinitely until we, we get our consultant. We can't give a date because we don't know when we'll have a consultant. Hillary, what do you want to do? Um, I think we can continue it indefinitely and we can put it back on as soon as we have what we need. So um, I can work with Charlie. Okay, 
Okay. I have a motion then to continue indefinitely. So moved. Is there a second? Second, Michael. Yes, go ahead. Um, can I request that we uh, uh, push it out for at least for two months rather than indefinitely, just so that gives us a uh, uh, some kind of time frame to keep things going on? And I mean, obviously, it can continue, get continued from there. I just don't want this to um, get, fall behind with all the other projects and everything else going on. That's fine. I, I was just going to make it clear that we don't intend to continue it forever and ever and ever. We want to come to a resolution. We don't like to keep these things hanging around either. It's just, you know, we want to move as fast as possible. If it's two months, that's fine. I don't have the meeting calendar in front of me, but that brings us to the end of February. So um, it's either gonna be the second meeting in February or the first meeting in March. That would be March 3rd. Barbara, will you accept that amendment to your sure. motion? Sure, sure. Okay. I just didn't think we could set a date, but if folks think we can, that's fine. Okay. And if we can get to it at any time before, I'm sure Hillary will contact you immediately. Okay, um, thank you very much. Okay, we need a voice vote on the continuance. Um, was there a second to Barbara's motion? I'm sorry. Well, I, the motion's changed now. So we're continuing till what date, Hillary? 3-3-21. Three, three, if not sooner. March 3rd, 2021, if not sooner. Okay. Is there a second? Second, John Cumbler. All right, I need a voice vote. Michael Fisher? Yes. Barbara Brennesel? Yes. Leon Shreve? Yes. Ben Fairbank? Yes. John Portnoy? Yes. And Debbie Freeman? Yes. Did I get John Cumbler? He's back. Yes. Okay. <laughs> all right. You're all set. All right. Thank you, guys, and uh, enjoy your holidays. You too. You too. The last matter for tonight is Behringer 0 off Bayview Avenue and 10 Bayview Avenue, Mac 35, parcels 210 and 33. A notice of intent, shorefront protection. Is there anyone here for this project? Uh, yes, through the chair, it's Don Monroe from Coastal Engineering, uh, representing uh, Mr. Barringer. So I'll try to make it uh, as quick as possible because I know it's getting late, but at the same time, uh, I heard the previous hearing. So we have a rock revetment that we're proposing here. We have an eroding coastal bank we have a house that's a pre-78 home. Uh, if you look at the plan, we have a section of the coastal bank that goes right through and under the existing deck. The applicant has tried a number of different uh, softer solutions, some sand drift fence and things like that uh, to really no avail. We are proposing a low profile rock revetment in this location for a couple of reasons. Uh, the main reason is that we uh, really are looking to stabilize the toe of the slope. And then Mr. Barringer would like to plant the upper part of the slope heavily to get vegetation to protect that portion as opposed to armoring the uh, whole coastal bank up to the flood elevation like the neighboring rock revetments. This uh, allows for overtopping in uh, major storm events so that sediment can still be taken from the coastal bank above the rock revetment, but the toe is protected. So if the applicant needs to place more sand on the bank, he would uh, do so in the interest of protecting his investment in the low profile rock revetment. We done, did a, uh, sorry, excuse me. We did a nourishment calculation based on not just the CZM transects. We've looked at those before, but in this location, because we have two revetments and a bulkhead to the south, that we do monitoring on. We've used a monitoring program for those two properties over the last eight years to a high success. They typically require anywhere between 50 yards at the Candell property up to 60 yards at the Spire property. We've based that on beach profiles, which we would want to do in this location as well, establish a typical beach profile in front of this particular proposal which we've already done based on our plan and our profiles that we show on the plan. And that would be our baseline. 
And uh, also you'll notice that the, to the north, we've uh, proposed some fiber rolls to soften the end effect, kept those 10 feet off the property next uh, to the north. And we're pro proposing an additional 20 yards over the fiber rolls to be incorporated into the annual nourishment uh, pro project. The 46 yards we calculated is based on the amount of space that the revetment has taken up on the coastal bank, knowing full well that we, we will see some overtopping. So we know that some of that sediment that's above will also uh, feed the beach. I do would like, uh, would like you to ask me any questions in regards to this particular project. Okay, um, I'll start. We were out there today and the property is not staked. Um, so it's difficult to see exactly where things start and where they end. Um, how high will the wall be? The, uh, if you, uh, on the profile view, we'll, go, we'll start there. Uh, we propose an elevation of 11 feet, uh, NAVD 88. So to get a perspective of that, the neighboring revetment on the spire property is NAVD elevation 15 to 16. So this one is roughly five, around five feet lower than the neighboring revetment. And the total area encompassed by the revetment is what? Uh, let's see, the, the length is uh, 231. Let's, uh, let me do a quick calculation. We don't usually get that as a request, but that's not a problem. Uh, 231, then the width is on the profile. Let's see, it's uh, one, two, approximately seven, seven feet. And the height of the height above grade. Uh, so when you say area, you just want to know the footprint it's covering, De Deborah? Yes, the disturbed area. Yep. Uh, hold on, I'm almost there. It's uh, 1,617 square feet. And what is the erosion rate at this particular location? Uh, yep, that's in the, uh, we did a beach monitoring and uh, nourishment calculation that is on page uh, right above the construction protocol, beach monitoring and nourishment protocol. The erosion rate in this location is 0.575 feet per year half uh, roughly just over half a foot per year. Right. Members of the commission. I just have one go ahead technical Barbara. question. Are these considered separate lots, separate buildable lots? Uh, the lots that are neck no, they are they are not. Zero, zero and ten are it's one continuous property. It's one continuous property owned by one owner, Mr. Barrett. Okay. All right. Can I ask a question? Yes. Sure. Why are you building it low? I, I guess we usually we we don't normally hear people building it low. We generally always hear people building it higher. So I, I'm a little worried about the concept of it overtopping over time. I. I it's not a, it's not unusual to build a low profile in some locations. So in this location, uh, it seems like it would be a fair approach, but it can be monitored over time and it's easily added to on the top if it's necessary. But I would say that if the applicant uh, maintains the vegetation above with some heavy duty beet, you know plantings of beach grass, that you might lose some sediment during major storm events, but not on a regular tidal basis. So I think this it, it would be appropriate in this location to to start off with this kind of uh, approach. I think as you move north more towards the north, 
because you you notice in the pictures in our um, on our one the first couple of pages in our performance standards, there's a couple of photographs that show the, the width of the beach in, the, in that location. You can see how wide it gets in that location. And I anticipate that that will continue with the beach nourishment that we provide. But because the beach is wider in this location, I think the erosion rate, even though it's a half a foot per year, isn't nearly as substantial as, as you move to the north. And I believe the sediment in this location based on the work we did for Ada Donald up the other end, when Jim O'Connell and Jim Mahala met on the site to allow us or determine whether we could extend that bulkhead, that they both as coastal geologists determined that the sediment transport in this location is towards the north. So well, I guess I'm looking at your um, fiber roll soft solution option two, and I only bring this up because we just had two other projects um, <laughs> And the, the commentary is very similar from one project to the next. Can you tell me um, more about why quar rolls wouldn't be an option for this whole stretch? Sure. Yep. If you bet, Hillary. In planting um, and nourishment. I mean, I hate I, I hate to put rocks somewhere when we know you've got a neighbor on the other end as well. Um, that doesn't have anything and possibly can't have anything. So I, I just, I'm curious what? about a softer solution here. You can't do a softer solution because we're still in a V zone and fiber rolls do not last in a V zone, not because of the, uh, the storm events, but they obviously don't last storm events, but because you have uh, tidal inundation more than a few times during the month. And once they get saturated, no matter how much sand you place during the winter, it, they're not gonna stay covered. UV de degradation as well as uh, complete tidal inundation over you know, a few four to five times per, per month will render the fiber rolls not stable. And so you'll just be back in there continually trying to maintain them. John Portnoy. Yeah, the application says that um, you'll be monitoring and in quotes adverse effect on the on the revetment will trigger beach nourishment. Um, <clears throat> how, do, how will its adverse effect in quotes be um, be determined? What are you measuring here? Well, what we do on the southern properties is we've got a baseline that we established back in 2012. That's a baseline meaning that we have a beach profile similar to the beach profile that you see on our plans for Mr. Barringer. That existing grade establishes a grade that we know will be the baseline for the beach. If we go out there next year, after let's say we build it this, this uh, winter and we go out there in the summer or fall next year and we see that the existing grade has dropped six inches or more, then that would indicate that we need to place nourishment and we'd be able to calculate that volume. And that's how we came up with the volumes for Candell and Spar because the original calculations were on the order of 20 yards for the Candells and 30 yards for the Spars. But based on the beach profiling, we're actually adding on a annual basis somewhere in the vicinity of 50 to the Candell property and 60 to the Spire property. So it's, it's hard data. And I understand we're supposed to use something similar to cesium transects to try to get an idea or a handle on what the erosion rate is. But I think everybody should be aware that the cesium transects are based on shoreline change and not based on actual bank retreat. You do see some resulting bank retreat over time, but they measured uh, the CZM data based on the water line, or you, if you will, the shoreline. Whereas our hard data in this location, because we've collected it for a number of years, and we're seeing that that is actually working by collecting the data and then adjusting the volume to the beach profile, that we're having a greater success rate than just an annual volume calculated by, by the cesium transect that uses historical data 
that isn't really hard data or not surveyed data. Our data is surveyed data, and we think that it'll work in this location as well. Hillary? Yes. Um, I think this is one where we're going to need an expert also. <laughs> I don't disagree with you. <laughs> I mean, I think we were quite clear, and Don, I believe you were at the meeting. Your colleague possibly was not at the meeting. He seemed sort of stunned that, that we would require that, but I think it's the best we can do at these times to shuffle these projects along so that we're comfortable. And I'm sorry, none of us asked for COVID. Um, we just want to make sure what we're looking at is the best for the environment in this location. And um, the more eyes on it, the better, as far as I'm concerned. I don't have a problem with that. I understand that fully. Um, yes, we have a member of the, the audience who wants to speak. I don't yes. know your name. Hi, sorry, I, I, I just uh, have, have a wrong screen name on there. My name is Jeff Vecchio. Um, I'm the uh, abutter. I'm at 625 and uh, 611 Old Wharf Road. I, I, I might have saw some of you folks there today. Um, I have a consultant uh, by the name of Stan Humphreys who's working with me. I think he's trying to jump on the call right now. But um, yeah, we just, um, sorry, we're a little late to the party, but um, I'm not sure what's been discussed, but there's just, um, we're, we're happy to work with uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Bowringer and, and, and um, Don Monroe on this, but there are just some outstanding items that, that we need to address in terms of sand nourishment quantities. I, I think we're at a, a little bit of a disagreement as to the calculations on that. Stan has a, a different story to tell on, on what he thinks is an appropriate amount of, of sand. Um, I, I think we also, uh, unfortunately, we got the NOI filing rather late. Um, the, uh, the, no the notice of intent got sent to a different place and someone else signed for it. So I, I literally just saw it tonight. Um, so we were kind of scurrying to review, but uh, there's, there's a little bit of an impasse just with the, with the amount of sand nourishment that we'd like some time to work out with um, our butter and uh, also the placement of that and uh, making sure that that's a yearly requirement. And, um, you know, there's, uh, I, I, think, I think that's, I took a couple of notes. That, that was the main stuff, I think. Um, and, and because some of the sand nourishment, excuse me, because some of the sand nourishment is being called to cross property lines, that's something that we wanted to uh, document with, with the board and also, um, we wanted to document that with the board and, and make sure it's known because I, I think it's a unique application and we want some of that sand brought over onto our property line so that we prevent any uh, scalloping or anything like that. So, um, you know, we, we, like to, we like to try to fast track it, you know, for our, for our neighbor, but I think there's a couple of outstanding items that we still need to, uh, to address. Okay, what we're suggesting is sending the project out for review by an independent third party reviewer, which would also give you time to consult with your neighbor about any proposals you two want to make jointly. Um, okay. So I, I think that's what we're looking at. Um, Nancy Chivetta's on the line. Do you have any comments about this project? Yes, I, I have not looked at this, um, and that's just on me. I, I didn't make it up to the uh, conservation department to to look at the, the plan. Um, I have a couple of quick questions. First of all, I'm just glad it's going to go to um, an independent um, evaluator. I think that's great. Uh, my question about the sand, and maybe this will happen in the review, and you can just ignore me for now, but... Um, if, if you've got, so first of all, Don, does through, through you, Deborah, to Don, um, does the 50 yards from Candell and the 60 yards at Spar, has that shown to increase the beach level there? It, uh, Nancy, uh, through the chair, Nancy, it's, it's shown to maintain the beach elevation to the original profile that was taken before the revetments were installed. Okay. That's why the salt um, marsh in front of those properties is doing pretty well. Yep. Yep. Um, and then, but it, 
I guess I just, <laughs> now I'm starting to worry. Now we're going to have all this other sand going in there. And, um, and as I'm learning that, uh, you say that the longshore migration goes to the north. And then I think about, uh, you know, I don't know how quickly, but it, is that going near Blackfish Creek? Um, and I, I just worry about, the, you know, th these are properties are very close to shellfish beds. Yeah. Uh, the yeah. thing that kind of separates them is that little salt, salt marsh, uh, but, you know, directly underneath the salt marsh and certainly in the salt marsh, there, there, there are live shellfish. That's shellfish yep. habitat. So, so yeah, Nancy, that's a, a very good point. That's the reason why we're doing monitoring as opposed to just a blanket volume of sand that someone might calculate based on a cesium transect, because that means they're not paying attention to the resource areas that we have collected data over over 20 years in this location. We've been working for the Candells and the Spars for a long time. And we've collected mm -hmm. this data and that's why the beach, the salt marsh and all that is doing well because we're sensitive to this area. Not only is it uh, high shellfish habitat, but it's salt marsh habitat. And if you over, over sediment your salt marsh, it'll smother it. It's not like beach grass, it'll just grow through it. So I fully agree that in most locations using the cesium transects is a good starting point. But even in the CZM Transect website, they talk about the fact that it's not the cure-all and end-all. Hard, raw survey data is way more important. And if you collect it over a number of years, you can demonstrate a real erosion rate that you can use to monitor your beaches. And, and we have extreme success in this location. I, I have to say it that way only because of the number of years I've worked with both parties. I have not worked with Bob yet. I can't imagine that we're gonna run into the same, uh, into anything different than what we're dealing with with Candell and Spar. We are approaching it a little differently with a lower profile, but I believe because of the beach width in this location and the salt marsh width, that we wanna remain sensitive to the existing conditions as much as we can but we can't go to a soft solution because that doesn't give the pre-78 home uh, the ability to protect it, to, to protect it. Plus we've got a roadway that's above that is their access that we need to consider as well, just like we did when we did the Candell and Spar proposals back in 2008, when we originally uh, applied for those uh, revetments. So there's access as well as a pre-70 home that we're, we're kind of looking at as well as the resource areas. But I don't have a problem with a third party looking it over. It's, it's, there's plenty of good reviewers out there that could look at, look at the project. Okay. Are there any other comments from the public or from the commissioners on the project? I do see Stan, um, Mr. Vecchio's consultant has unmuted himself. I don't know if he would care to speak. Good evening, commissioners. Um, yes. My name is Stan Humphreys. I'm a coastal geologist with ECR, and I've been working with Jeff, um, interacting with Don um, to better understand um, their goals, um, some of the structures that they're proposing. They've modified some of those structures at our request, which is good. Um, I do tend to start out with the CZM DEP method of calculating volumes. And um, we're sort of in discussions with them about that. I think we can um, take another look to see where the proximity of the salt marshes are. Um, Appreciate that. Give it a look that Don is talking about. But um, my gut feel is that it's, it's not adequate to protect the end scour that has been going on and may become more excessive with, um, with the revetment extending this far north. That's all that I have for tonight, I think. Unless you have questions for me. No, I think with our third party reviewer, we're gonna look at the issues um, of NSCOUR. We're gonna look at the issues of the height of the wall. We're gonna look at the issues of the amount of beach nourishment and where it will travel. Um, I think we're just gonna look at everything because I think we really need help on this. So you'll be yeah, continuing the hearing for, I'm sorry. Yes. Oh, go ahead, Stan. 
I was just going to ask about the continuation, what sort of time period. The last one we continued until um, March 3rd um, to give two months for the process because of the holidays. But if we can get it done faster, we will certainly do that and contact you. But I, I would think that's a reasonable date. Could I have a motion then? I move that we postpone this to March 3rd or sooner when possible, uh, so we can have a third party look at this issue. I Is there a second? I second. Before right. you vote- um, Through the chair, we, through the, uh, just before you vote, through the chair, I do have the owner, uh, I believe he uh, was on earlier. I just wanna make sure that he understands and we understand that we have a situation that's much different than the previous application in that the coastal bank, top of coastal bank, does go right under a portion of the existing deck. And at that south, southern corner of the existing dwelling, as you see on the plan, I believe the top of the coastal bank is about five feet from the foundation. So I, as much as we hope there isn't any gonna be any reason for an emergency, we wouldn't apply for an emergency necessarily but I think it would behoove us to make sure we try to move this one a little faster than, uh, than you might. Than, than, I just hope you can move it faster so that we don't have to deal with something that does present more of an emergency condition. We will move it as fast as we can, right, Hillary? Yes, absolutely, absolutely. You can have that discussion back in your office, Don, that you requested your project to be put in front of his. <laughs> Yeah, I got it. <laughs> yes, we will move all projects as fast as possible. <laughs> um, I, I got to say something though. How, how do you like how I'm trying to teach the little chickens? <laughs> <laughs> well, Don, you've got a lot of work to do. <laughs> Lori, do you, would you like um, two motions? Is that what you were saying? Yes, please. No. One for oh, the sorry, third day review and one to continue to... Oh. Um, March 3rd. I just was going to ask, Bob's been on the line. He usually likes to have a few words with us. I don't know if he has anything to say oh, to us tonight. There he is. He's here. Hillary, happy holiday, Hillary. Oh, Hope you're doing not great. Too, not too much, Bob. That's all I'm allowed. Four words. <laughs> Thank you. John, would you accept an amendment to your motion to divide it into two parts? The first part to have a separate motion to appoint a third party expert and then to continue the, the hearing until March 3rd, if not sooner. I accept that as a friendly amendment. Okay, could Barbara, I have a- you accept it as well. Barbara? I second. Okay, so the first motion is for the motion for a third party expert. I need a voice vote. John Portnoy? Yes. Ben Fairbanks? Yes. Michael Fisher? Recuse. Barbara Branisell. Yes. Leon Shreve. Yes. John Cumbler. Yes. And Debbie Freeman, yes. The second motion is a motion for continuance to March 3rd, 2021, if not sooner, um, contingent upon receiving the expert's report. I need a, mo a motion on that. I'm sorry, I need a voice vote on that. John Portnoy. Yes. Ben Fairbank. Yes. Leon Shreve. Yes. Barbara Brennesel. Yes. John Cumbler. Yes. Michael Fisher. Refuse. And Debbie Freeman. Yes. So you're all set. Thank you so much, all. Okay. The, the last thing is, does anybody need any clarification on what forms we have to submit for anything, or are you all set? We, have, we weren't given blank forms with a packet, correct? They were in an envelope last time. Okay, so I have them in the house. They what, should be in the house. What yes. forms am I signing? Uh, should I go through it? Yes. yes. Why don't you? Or, an order of conditions for Callahan. An order of conditions for Baker and El Cesar. A, a determination of applicability for Thornton. Uh, extension permit for orders of condition for Lauren Nominee Trust and a certificate of compliance for Simon Sagan. Perfect. 
What happened? What happened with Booza? That was got pulled off because they had already been issued a certificate in the eighties and just never recorded it. Oh, okay. Okay. Thank you, Barbara. You're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I need a motion to adjourn, and we can finish. I move so adjourn. Okay. And is there a second? Second. Second. All right. Voice vote again. John Portnoy. Yes. Ben. Yes. Leon. Yes. John Cumbler. Yes. Michael. Yes. Barbara. Yes. Debbie. Yes. Goodbye. Bye. Bye. Thank, Thank you. you, Debbie. Thank you all. <laughs> hey, Debbie Holidays. You too.